Honourable Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the tradi traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Yes, President. I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. It is my very sad duty to inform the Senate of the death on the 16th of January 2023 of Senator Andrew James Jim Molan, AODSC, who served New South Wales with distinction in this place from 2017. I call the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion in relation to the death of Senator Jim Molan. I believe leave is granted. I thank the Senate. I move that the Senate records its deep sorrow at the death on 16 January 2023 of Senator Andrew James Jim Molan, AO, DSC, Senator for New South Wales and retired Major General, and places on record its appreciation and gratitude for his service to the nation and the parliament and tenders its profound sympathy to his family in their bereavement. President, as I move this motion to mark the contribution made by our late Dear colleague Jim Molan, I begin by giving thanks. The celebrant at Jim's funeral, Father James Grant, asked one particular thing of all of us in memory of Jim. It was to better embrace the attitude of gratitude that Jim demonstrated for all that was good in his life and for those who enriched it. Firstly, I posthumously thank Jim for his service to our nation and to our parliament for the deep and dividing values that he lived across all facets of his life and for the care and friendship that he demonstrated to family, to friends, to soldiers in arms, to colleagues and to countless others. It is in Jim's memory that this Senate rightly gathers today. I acknowledge the thoughtful consideration of Senator Wong in enabling me to move this motion on behalf of Jim's former Senate colleagues today. I thank all of those who enriched Jim's life and who enabled his contribution to Australia, most particularly his dearly loved wife, Anne, children, Michael, Felicity, Erin and Sarah, Jim's adored grandchildren, his siblings, parents and extended family. To Anne and the other family members gathered in the gallery today, I send a big, loving hug your way. We will hear much today of Jim's service to our nation, fittingly so. But it is the service of others in support of Jim that he would wish us to firstly acknowledge today. In acknowledging Jim, we also say thank you to all of those who served alongside Jim in our defence forces, in public service roles, in community or political organisations, here in the Australian Senate or in so many other walks of life. 
Jim was grateful for all that you gave him. And so too are we, as recipients of his wisdom, his work, his camaraderie and his friendship. I extend particular acknowledgement to Jim's parliamentary and electorate staff, who have lost a leader to whom their commitment was evident and for whom they gave so much assistance, especially during some of his most trying times. President Andrew James Molan was born in Melbourne on 11 April 1950. Australia was in the early years of a halcyon post-war period of growth, rising prosperity and relative stability. Globally, however, the uncertainties of the Cold War was to hang over the years ahead. Jim was one of six children, born to Andy and Noni Molan. Jim described Andy, a World War II veteran, and Noni as being quintessentially working-class people who earned a middle-class lifestyle via their hard work. He particularly acknowledged the drive of his mum in helping her children to view education as a vehicle for success in life. Pursuing his childhood ambitions, Jim was admitted at the age of 18 into the Royal Military College, Duntroon. Both liked and respected by his classmates while at Duntroon and all throughout his life, Jim lived true to his view that blind obedience does not make for good soldiers. He would challenge and test, occasionally earn reprimand, but ultimately show the same respect in the same way that he earned the respect of those who served with him. As he said in his first speech to this place, leadership is everything. Leadership certainly was at the heart of everything that Jim achieved. While at Duntroon, Jim was to meet Anne Williams, the love of his life and true partner in his life. Their married life was to start in the midst of Jim's first overseas posting from 1972 to 1975 in Papua New Guinea. This was to be his first period of service as an Australian serviceman helping another country on their journey along the sometimes difficult path towards democracy. Jim would go on to serve in Indonesia using his Bahasa language skills on two postings as Australia's defence attaché, including during the fall of the Suharto regime. He served in East Timor as it moved towards independence, in the Solomon Islands and in Iraq. He was to see different threats, notably terrorism, grow in the challenge they posed and the nature of conflict evolved with those changes in threats and technology. But whatever those changes, Jim was always emphatic that people and leadership remained the keys to success. It was in Iraq that, while serving as Chief of Operations to the multinational force, Jim had effective responsibility for the command of more Allied troops than any other Australian military leader since World War II. While never pretending that these operations were faultless, Jim was rightly proud of the role so many played in trying to support peace, democracy and self-determination. During his 40 years of service in the Australian Army, Jim would also serve in Malaysia, Germany and the United States. He was to serve in the 9th Battalion Royal Queensland Regiment, the 3rd and 6th Battalions Royal Australian Regiment and as the commander of the Australian Defence Colleges. Along the way, he was also to train as a helicopter pilot, cementing one of his great loves, flying. Jim and Anne were also to welcome four children amidst the transient and mobile life of military service. Sarah in 1981, Erin in 1983, Felicity in 1984 and Michael in 1989. In July 2008, by then Major General Molan retired from the Army. Jim was rightly highly decorated, having been awarded the Distinguished Service Cross in 2006, been made an officer by the United States in the Legion of Merit in 2004, and firstly, a member of the Order of Australia in 1992, subsequently an officer of the Order of Australia in 2000. Retirement was never likely to suit Jim Molan, though. 
His first book, Running the War in Iraq, was published in 2008. Jim and Ann settled on a property near Queanbeyan, and he threw himself into service as a member of the local volunteer bushfire brigade. He was to use his love of flying to support rescue and emergency operations and also take that knowledge, skills and his leadership attributes to become a director of the National Aerial Firefighting Centre. Public service was soon to call again, in a different way. Jim has been acknowledged by former Prime Ministers Abbott and Morrison as a co-author of the Coalition's Operation Sovereign Borders policy. With the election of the Abbott government in 2013, Jim was appointed as a special envoy to help oversee its implementation. As Jim was to subsequently say, and I quote, Australia had to consistently demonstrate national resolve in facing down the people smugglers. Jim was a big part of that resolve, which didn't just stop the boats, but also stopped the deaths at sea and enabled the winding down of offshore processing centres. Through this time, Jim had also been a frequent and thoughtful commentator on national security matters, writing extensively about the challenges faced in the war in Afghanistan, the ongoing threats of terrorism, the battle for democracy, the strength of Western values and border protection policies. Jim's many divergent experiences, his love of country and his love of public policy culminated in him becoming active in the Liberal Party and seeking Senate pre-selection ahead of the 2016 double dissolution election. He was to be unsuccessful in securing a winnable position, but fate or destiny were clearly determined that Jim was to serve in this place. It is likely that Jim Molan is the only senator in history to have been declared elected by the High Court as a result of the disqualification of others, then lost the subsequent election from another unwinnable position on a Senate ticket, then chosen to fill a Senate casual vacancy, and then successfully re-elected on his third attempt. Such a roller coaster experience may have embittered others, but not Jim Molan. He treasured every single day that he was a member of the Senate from December 2017 to June 2019, and again from November 2019 until his death last month. Jim Molan was determined to make each day here count, and he did. Looking back on his first speech five years ago in 2018, Jim demonstrated his deep intellect and knowledge in global affairs and military strategy. He specifically singled out the impact of Russia, Iran, China and North Korea in threatening the liberal world order and creating strategic uncertainty and instability. In different ways, the events and actions that have occurred since have certainly validated his concerns from that time. Some commentators portrayed Jim purely as a China hawk. This was simplistic and overlooked Jim's earliest statements that we should welcome China's emergence as a world power, especially the development gains it has delivered for humanity. He was clear that we should welcome China, though, from a position of strength and needed to increase our self-reliance. For Jim, it was a simple case of showing leadership in the face of a saying that he often repeated, be ready and be strong, because the world is a nasty and brutal place. Jim was willing to speak out, even when it was uncomfortable for those he liked, trusted or supported. He did so with a sense of duty, a sense of purpose and a belief that it was necessary for him to do so for the sake of the country that he loved and to preserve its values of liberty and democracy. Self-reliance was something Jim argued required a comprehensive national security strategy, embodying much more than just the purchase of military equipment or defence force posture. He wrote about this, along with the potential threats we face, in his final book, Danger on Our Doorstep, for which Jim undertook interviews with an array of respected global military thinkers and strategists. Many former defence ministers were recipients of Jim's wisdom, whether it had been solicited or not. But it was nearly always welcomed because it was delivered with the purest of motivations, the deepest of conviction, 
and the greatest of consideration. Once on a mission to achieve an outcome, Jim's efforts were never solely directed at defence ministers. Prime ministers and others, including finance ministers, were not exempt. I too was the subject of Jim's drive to ensure Australia's national security capabilities were not narrowly defined through the prism of defence posture or defence materiel, but in all aspects of our industrial and societal capability. Unfailingly polite, but equally relentless, Jim would make his case in meetings, conversations, reports, papers, messages, interviews and articles. It was this advocacy by Jim that, in part, saw the specific budgeting of funding for a dedicated Office of Supply Chain Resilience in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Many other colleagues will have their own examples of the impact Jim had on policies, decisions and recommendations throughout his time here, which also saw him make thoughtful contributions on issues such as veterans' wellbeing, nuclear energy and, at a very personal level, stillbirths. As Senator for New South Wales in the true sense of those words, Jim was also deeply committed to representing the state of New South Wales. As Tourism Minister, I travelled with Jim throughout South Coast communities to meet businesses struggling from the impact of bushfires and the onslaught of COVID. These were never just visits, though, because Jim's follow-up was relentless. It was clear that he cared. Jim's advocacy was respected so widely because it was consistent. If you knew Jim and understood his values, then you could nearly always know where he was likely to come from. As the Australian's foreign editor, Greg Sheridan, wrote following his death, more than anyone I've known, in Jim Molan, there was not a sliver of daylight between what he said and what he did. But that predictability did not mean that Jim could be neatly categorised or pigeonholed. He said that, on social issues, he would make his mind up issue by issue, and he did, voting yes in the same-sex marriage vote and quietly supporting the principle of an Australian republic. The last two years of Jim's service as a senator were a difficult time. He battled cancer with a determination and a resilience that surprised none who knew him. Jim had more to do, more to give, and desperately wanted more time with Anne, with his children, and especially with his five grandchildren. Complaint was never a part of how Jim responded to his cancer diagnosis. As has been noted elsewhere, if anything, he shielded those he loved and those he worked alongside as much as he could, always painting an optimistic view of when he would be back at full speed. Treatments and infections did impede Jim's ability to do all that he wanted to, but he never stopped contributing, continuing to undertake interviews, to write, to scrutinise and to hold governments to account, both ours and the new Labor government. Following the change of government last year, Jim kept reassuring me that, even when he could not attend sittings due to treatment, he was working with his team on questions for new ministers and that he would be back here for estimates. True to form, he was back here at estimates, making his last appearance at defence estimates on 9 November last year to grill officials in his polite way on the defence strategic review, their military preparedness over five and ten year horizons and the divergent threats that Australia faces. Jim Molan was true to form, serving the interests of Australia right to the end. It is perhaps fitting that I was in Papua New Guinea, the country of Jim's first overseas posting, when I was advised on the evening of Monday 16 January of his death. It is a death felt with great sadness by all of Jim's colleagues who valued his abiding commitment to Australia, his diligence as part of our Liberal and Coalition Senate team and his thoughtful, caring friendship. As a national outpouring of respect and commemoration ensued, it is clear that Jim's life had touched and earned the respect of countless individuals. Australia has lost a true patriot in the best sense of that word, and a serviceman who demonstrated unwavering dedication to the safety and security of our nation. Jim Molan served Australia as a soldier, a diplomat, 
a senator, a community volunteer and a strategist. He was a man of principle who was willing to make sacrifices for his beliefs and embodied the best of service to his nation. We can all best honour Jim by remaining diligent to the enduring safety, security and peace that we rely upon to safeguard Australia's democracy, liberty and prosperity. Jim's funeral service concluded with a reading from The Infantier, a poem written by Captain Philip Greaves, Greaves during World War II. The poem concludes with the stanza, Should you meet him, untidy, begrimed and fatigued, don't indulge in unwarranted mirth, for the brave infantier deserves more than your sneer. He is truly the salt of the earth. Jim Molan was truly the salt of the earth. We are each better for knowing him and wiser for having served alongside him. Australia is stronger thanks to Jim's comprehensive service to our nation. His life did make a difference. Thank you, Jim. We salute you. Farley. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Wong. Thank you, President. And I rise on behalf of the government to express our condolences following the passing of our colleague, Senator Andrew James Molan, AODSC, better known to us all as Senator Jim Molan, who passed away on the 16th of January 2023 at the age of 72. And I convey at the outset the government's condolences and my personal sympathy to Jim's family and friends. And I particularly acknowledge the members of his family who are here today, uh, including his wife Anne and daughters Erin and Felicity and many others. I also express my personal sympathy to my colleagues across the chamber on your loss. It is a sad circumstance that this is the third of our number we have eulogised in just 18 months. Senator Jim Molan lived a life of public service. He was called to serve, he chose to serve, and he did so with distinction. Jim Molan entered the Senate following a substantial career in the military that saw him attain the rank of Major General. When he, was, he quite easily could have enjoyed life at a slower pace following retirement from the Australian Army. He instead took up duty once more as a determined advocate for the people of New South Wales. And his time as a parliamentarian was distinguished by his vigorous contribution to the national security debate, which will outlast his time in this place. But, uh, but his work extended well beyond national security issues. Jim Mollen was a person who placed high importance on personal character and integrity, no more so than in his own conduct. Prime Minister Albanese described him as a man of principle and a politician of conviction, someone who engaged across political divides courteously and generously. And that capacity to engage in that way with people from all walks of life is fondly remembered by so many. He leaves a legacy of professionalism, of dedication and of service. Born in Melbourne, Jim Mullen had only one career in mind and he went straight to it as soon as he could. He graduated from the Royal Military College, Duntroon, in 1971, after entering at the age of 18. Between the beginning and the end of his military career, his distinguished service includes deployments to Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, Timor Leste, Malaysia, Germany, the US and Iraq. Indeed, he was deployed to serve at many important junctures in our history. He was in Papua New Guinea as it turned the corner to independence a watershed moment in the life of two nations, with the end of Australian colonialism and the Papua New Guinean people achieving self-government. Posted to Jakarta on multiple occasions in the 1990s, he was in Indonesia, then Timor-Leste through the fall of President Suharto, the Asian financial crisis and Timorese independence. Occasionally he would address me in Bahasa Indonesia, a legacy of this time. Selamat pagi, Ibu, he would say. And for those who speak any Indonesian, you would know that is a very respectful manner of address. He also served as commander, Australian Defence Colleges, amongst other roles. In Iraq, he served for a year as the chief of operation of coalition forces. He was responsible for overseeing some 300,000 personnel, more than any Australian since World War II. It was a difficult and dangerous deployment, including the 2005 election, 
during which time coalition and Iraqi security forces were attacked hundreds of times. His military service was appropriately recognised through the award of the Distinguished Service Cross by the Australian Government and the Legion of Merit by the United States Government. The citation for the Distinguished Service Cross, awarded in 2006, states it was awarded for distinguished service in command and leadership in action while serving as Deputy Chief of Staff for Strategic Operations and Deputy Chief of Staff Civil Military Operations with Multinational Force Iraq from 2000, April 2004 to April 2005 during Operation Catalyst. He was also twice re recognised in the Military Division of the Order of Australia, including for his service as the head of the Australian Defence Staff in Jakarta during the Indonesian and East Timor Crisis. Following the conclusion of his military career, Senator Jim Molan remained active as a public commentator on matters of defence and security. Living on a property not far from Canberra, his active involvement in the local fire service would soon extend beyond his own brigade. In combination with his experience flying helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft and tactical and crisis management expertise, it led to a role as director of the National Aerial Firefighting Centre. He also worked as a consultant and in public policy and became actively involved in politics as a result of this. And as Senator Birmingham has said, he played a significant role in shaping coalition policy before and after the 2013 election. Having unsuccessfully stood for the election to the Senate in 2016, Senator Jim Mullen first entered this place in 2017. He was unsuccessful in the 2019 election, notwithstanding a personal campaign for people to vote for him below the line, which yielded nearly 3 per cent of the statewide total. <coughs> However, later that year he became a senator once more when he was chosen by the New South Wales Parliament to fill the casual vacancy created following the resignation of Arthur Sinodinas to become our ambassador in the United States, and he was subsequently returned at the 2022 election. Senator Jim Molan used his platform to reflect upon and advocate for Australian military and security policy. He was deeply concerned about strategic impact and capability and consistently advocated for an integrated national security strategy. He advocated for this publicly, I'm sure to his colleagues within the coalition, uh, to all of us in the parliament throughout his time in the parliament. He also wanted Australian governments to be more open in talking about strategic risk. He asked questions and estimates hearings, and most recently I was the recipient of them as we sat on opposite sides of the table for the first time. While Senator Mullen's committee work covered the breadth of national security issues, his, well extended, his work extended well beyond those. I'd like to make mention of uh, a Senate Select Committee that examined a topic of particular significance in the lives of many Australians, including in this chamber and to him personally. This, these were the Senate Select Committee on Stillbirth Education Research and also the Senate Select Committee on Autism. As Deputy Chair of the Senate Select Committee on Stillbirth Education and Research, Senator Molan contributed alongside Senators McCarthy, Kachui, Keneally, Rice and Billick to this historic and important inquiry. Labor senators, including former Senator Keneally, conveyed to me how highly they rated Senator Molan's contribution. He brought a combination of compassion and personal experience to this difficult and emotional topic. When the report was tabled in the Senate in 2018, Senator Molan spoke of his experience and that of his family. I was so deeply moved by his words that day, as were so many others. His collegiate parliamentary engagement on sensitive issues, whether personal issues or security issues, spoke to Jim Molan's character. During his time in this place and prior to this arrival, Senator Molan articulated certain policy positions I do not share. We also did share common policy positions and we were able to find common ground. Senator Jim Molan was a man who I respected. He treated issues of defence, national security and foreign affairs with the maturity they deserve. I honour his deep convictions forged in his lifetime of service. And during our parliamentary exchanges, as recently as the recent budget estimates hearing, we were able to engage in dialogue respectfully and without rancour. One of the things that makes our country strongest is our ability to look to the national interest 
and to engage constructively without acrimony or animosity. As Senator Mullen's family said, he was many things, a soldier, a pilot, an author, a volunteer firefighter, and a senator. These roles and the many others Jim Mullen took on in his lifetime speaks to his ability, his capacity, and his enthusiasm. And even through his illness, Senator Mullen continued to be a strong advocate for Australia's defence and national security and a dedicated servant of the people of New South Wales in this parliament. Senator Birmingham spoke in his contribution about the importance of living life with gratitude. And it is true, in gratitude, we find a way to contentment, to peace and to wisdom. Well, Australia owes a gratitude, a debt of gratitude to Jim Mullen for his dedicated service to our country in our Defence Force, through public policy and in our Parliament. But of course he was much more than this. Senator Mullen was a husband, a father, a grandfather, a brother, a friend and a colleague. And he often spoke of his love for his family. His devotion was clear to all who knew him. So I close by expressing again my personal sympathies and the sympathies of the government to his wife Anne, their four children, grandchildren, and other members of his family, as well as Jim's loyal staff, friends, colleagues, and all he served with. I salute Jim Mullen. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Madam President. And it's with a heavy heart that I rise today to join my colleagues on reflecting on the life and service to our nation of Senator Jim Mullen. Rarely we speak in this chamber on days such as this of colleagues that we've served with, that each and every one of us uh, have known. And so it is with a particular uh, heavy heart that I rise today and associate particularly the National Party's comments um, with the Leader of the Government and particularly with uh, the Leader of the Opposition, Senator Birmingham. A devoted husband to wife Anne, brother, father and grandfather, and mate as we heard at his funeral. On behalf of the Nats, we convey our deepest condolences to Jim's family and friends. He was a giant, a warrior, taken too soon. Uh, and as Senator Birmingham said, and others have made reference uh, since his passing, a true patriot. He was also a great friend to rural and regional Australia. He understood regional issues and he was not afraid to get out and across our regions, particularly in his beloved home state of New South Wales. Despite some tensions earlier in his parliamentary career, Jim was a great friend to the Nationals team and regularly attended our events and worked collegiately. And I can also attest, um, as former Minister for Emergency Management and Agriculture, to Jim's advocacy, strong advocacy, uh, in those particular policy areas. We would often speak about uh, the needs and interests of rural and regional Australia and the recovery uh, from the bushfires in New South Wales. Many have already attempted to describe Jim's passion, character and contribution to our society in this nation, but if I could use just one word that encapsulates all these, it would be patriot. He met everybody with a really warm, open smile uh, an engaging and open spirit, which often we come into the Senate and uh, we don't display that openness when we are actually tasked with representing all the spectrum of ideas that exist across our nation. But Jim was prepared to listen, to learn, to engage deeply and then to respond respectfully. He had a profound sense of duty to his family, the Defence Force and his nation. He served his community constantly, working with charities and the rural fire service, serving in our parliament and our country and the Australian Army. He joined the Australian Army as an officer cadet in 1968. Now, For the political nerds amongst us, that was also the same year that Black Jack McEwen was Prime Minister for a couple of weeks, which we in the National Party wish we had been a little longer, but McMahon had other ideas. It was a time that many in this country would not remember or know, but I think it's important to reflect that Australia was engaged in the Vietnam War at that time. 
More than 100 Australians had already lost their lives in a conflict far away, and 1968 became the deadliest year of that conflict. It was in this context that a young Jim Molan couldn't wait to sign up and serve. A distinguished career followed over the next 40 years, including posts in Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, East Timor and Iraq. He served as platoon commander in the 1st Battalion, Pacific Island Regiment, Adjutant 9th Battalion, Royal Queensland Regiment, Rifle Company Commander, 3rd Battalion, Royal Australian Regiment, Commanding Officer, 6th Battalion, RAR, Commander of the Army's Merchandise, 1st Brigade, Commander of the 1st Division and Joint Force Headquarters, Commander of the Australian Defence College, Army Attaché in Jakarta between 92-94 and Defence Attaché between 98 and 99 during the East Timor independence crisis. His time in Indonesia was recognised in 1995 when he received a decoration for merit to the Indonesian Armed Forces and again in 2000, becoming an officer in the Order of Australia for service in East Timor. In 2004, his military experience and strategic expertise led him to be deployed again, where he served at the headquarters multinational force in Iraq as Deputy Chief of Staff of Operations. This was at the height of operations overseeing continuous and intense combat operations. His leadership and strategic advice was recognised in that theatre of operations, and he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross and the Legion of Merit by the United States government. After returning from Iraq, Jim served as an advisor to the Vice Chief of the Defence Force on joint warfaring lessons and concepts and finally retiring at the rank of Major General in 2008. I mention these roles, services and awards because it goes to the depth of knowledge and understanding he had of Australia's defence capability and strategy. So when Jim spoke on defence matters, people listened. He wrote not one but three books on the subject and was a thought leader of his time. In 2013, when the former Rudd-Gillard Rudd government had exposed Australia to the threat of porous borders and people smuggling, it was Jim who was called to help. Soon after the coalition swept to power in 2013, he was appointed by Prime Minister Tony Abbott as Special Envoy for Operation Sovereign Borders, co-authoring the strategy to stop the boat and create a sophisticated defence and border force intervention in a complex region. His deep understanding of the Indo-Pacific, military tactics and defence strategy were key in ending human trafficking, people smuggling and ensuring Australia's northern border was secure. And despite what some may say uh, and continue to say about Operation Sovereign Borders, it was not only a success but it continues as bipartisan government policy to this day and is being seen internationally. Uh, as a policy worth implementing. Following this success, it became as no surprise to many when he was elected by the Liberal Party to join us in this place in 2018, boosting the coalition's expertise on defence and security. And albeit a comparatively brief time in this place, it was incredibly well spent. He didn't waste a minute here. And despite his towering physical presence, uh, he never looked rushed at all, um, despite being urgent in his advocacy at every single moment. It's actually a unique gift in this place. He was quick to employ the oversight mechanisms contained in the standing orders and served on many committees scrutinising Australia's defence readiness and forward strategy. And for those uh, who are reading this at some future date, uh, he was part of the government uh, whilst also scrutinising. Um, the strategy and the spending in that space. So he's a very much a senator's senator in that regard. And we were very fortunate to have had his knowledge, expertise and passion. He was a vocal advocate for improving Australia's defence capability and strategic response. None were more ardent than his advocate advocation uh, for greater transparency in Australia's future national defence strategy. In his last opinion piece for The Australian in November, he said, and I quote, a more open, frank dialogue is required between Australia's government and its people about the challenges that lie ahead. War is now more likely than at any point in the past 80 years, but our next conflict won't involve a few thousand troops on faraway shores. 
It will occur on our doorstep, impacting the entire nation. And if government is hoping that when this happens it can rely on Australians to fight in our defence or at the very least pay the bills, now is the time to start a very candid discussion. And the late Jim Molan was right. The invasion of Ukraine cannot be seen as an isolated act, nor can we be ignorant to the coercive powers of nations seeking to exploit others or the growing complexity uh, in our own region. region. We have faced some serious challenges as a nation over the past three years, and we have seen how quickly international settings can change. From viruses to the downfall of political regimes to regional conflict, our world has changed rapidly. It has reminded us all that whilst the efforts of a peaceful um, continue to outweigh the efforts of the malevolent few, conflict in this world is inevitable. And as a nation, we must meet the task of constant vigilance. There is much we can do to delay conflicts, but we must always be prepared to meet it and we must always be stronger in that moment than we were before for the decisions we have all made in this place. Senator Jim Molan knew this and, like a young Churchill, warned of the dangers of being ill-prepared. He sought to ensure Australia is ready for whatever came next. His contributions to this debate, I hope, will be heeded and they will be sorely missed over time, but I'm confident his legacy will live on. Jim met his last battle with typical resolute determination an incredibly positive spirit, and he's an example for us all uh, when we face adversity. Uh, sympathy and condolences to Anne and his four children and grandchildren and wider family and friends. Uh, vale, Jim Mullen. Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And I too rise to pay my respects to our colleague, Senator Jim Mullen. And in commencing my comments today, I do just want to acknowledge Jim's family and, in particular, those members who have been able to join us in the gallery today. At his funeral in particular, but in life generally, Jim had so many rich experiences. There are almost too many to actually talk about. We are going to hear so many of them today. And at his funeral in particular, or at the celebration of his life, should I say, uh, we are all able to be privileged to the presentation of his military record. But when you look at what was the one rich experience in life that Jim treasured more than anything, and it was one that he was so happy to talk about at any time, on any day, and that was, of course, his family. That was the richest experience in Jim's life despite serving us at the highest levels, whether that be in the armed forces or the Australian Senate. His family was the richest experience in his life. Colleagues will recall that when Jim walked into the final coalition Senate party room, and it was unexpected to have Jim uh, join us that day, uh, he received resounding applause. We were just all so honoured but so happy to have Jim join us for that final Senate party room meeting. All of us knew he had had a battle on his hands. That was something that uh, was on the public record. But I don't think any of us knew that we would be farewelling him so soon. We had certainly hoped not, and many of us had prayed not. The rousing applause, though, wasn't just for a man who was fighting a very brave battle with cancer. It was for so much more. It was for the man that we, as his colleagues, had come to know, respect and love. It goes without saying that Jim was a giant of a man. And since his passing, so many members of the Liberal Party in particular have said to me, Michaelia, what is the one thing that you personally remember about Jim Molan? And I think, as Senator McKenzie has just articulated, the one thing I will always remember about our colleague Jim Molan is his smile. 
whenever Jim walked into a room. It did not matter what the day was, what the time was, what the issue was, what the challenge was. It didn't matter what the battle he was that he was personally fighting. He was always smiling. And when you saw Jim smile, you knew, oh, everything's actually going to be all right. He was without a doubt a true patriot and dedicated servant of this nation. And of course, that wasn't just throughout the period of time in this place, but throughout his career and life. But he was, as we have heard, so much more as well. He was, without a doubt, a gentleman, a decent and honourable man, and as I've said, and as we are going to continually hear today, he was a committed family man, dedicated to his wife Anne, children and grandchildren. Jim's service to the nation began at a very young age. Jim was born into a military family, the son of World War II veteran Andrew and his wife Noni. Jim grew up in Melbourne and dreamt of one day entering the military. At the age of 18, he was accepted into the Royal Military College, Duntroon. His distinguished career started with his first posting to the 1st Battalion, Pacific Islands Regiment in Papua New Guinea. He spent more than three years there as the regiment worked to help PNG move towards independence and democracy in 1975. As we have all heard, early in his stint in PNG, he returned to Australia to marry Anne Williams, whom he had met whilst at Duntroon. And this was to form a life partnership. Following the PNG posting, Jim spent time serving in the 9th Battalion, Royal Queensland Regiment, and in the 3rd and 6th Battalions, Royal Australian Regiment. In 1992, as a colonel, Jim was posted to Jakarta as the Australian Defence Force attaché, where he served until 1994. In 1998, as a brigadier, he returned as defence attaché for another two years, witnessing Indonesia's chaos following the fall of President Suharto, the Asian financial crisis and East Timor's vote for independence. He joined the Australian Army deployment in East Timor in 1999 and later became commander of the Australian Defence College. It doesn't stop there, though. Jim was posted to Baghdad in 2004 as Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations for the new multinational force. He effectively commanded a force of 270,000, including more than 130,000 Americans, the rest drawn from Iraq and dozens of coalition nations. In Iraq, Jim led the creation of new mechanisms to coordinate and improve the security of vital infrastructure, monitoring overall security repair, ministerial liaison, contracting and command. He was in command during the battles of Fallujah, Najjar, Talafah, Samara and Mosul. Jim survived an anti-aircraft gun attack on a Black Hawk helicopter. It was one of at least 15 attacks that he survived, including from rocket-propelled grenades and mortars. The Iraqi election scheduled for January 2005 represented a huge challenge. In the seven days before the Iraqi election in January 2005, coalition and Iraqi security forces were attacked around 800 times and 260 times on election day. On the night before the election, a rocket hit a room next to Jim's room, killing two Americans. It failed to detonate, probably saving Jim's life. Jim was a highly decorated soldier during his military career. He was awarded the Australian Active Service Medal, Defence Force Service Medal Federation Star, the Australian Defence Medal, the Papua New Guinea Independence Medal, the Order of the Star of Utah, Dharma Third Class Indonesia, Officer of the Legion of Merit, United States, and the Distinguished Service Cross. Of that, I know his family 
is so very proud. He was also appointed a member of the Order of Australia in 1992 and officer of the Order of Australia in 2000. From the moment Jim stepped into the Senate chamber in 2017, he showed wisdom, integrity, commitment, resilience and perseverance. As we have heard, Jim's extensive and highly decorated military career meant he brought strong views into this place about Australia's place in the world, our defence capabilities and our future requirements. His military experience and security knowledge meant he was an invaluable member on the Joint Standing Committees for Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, as well as migration. Jim was, without a doubt, a conviction politician. But at the same time, despite being a conviction politician, he was someone, and we learnt this so well, who would listen to all sides of an argument before deciding his position. But once Jim had decided a position, he then fiercely held and defended it. He was a great believer in the Liberal values and worked hard within the party to build grassroots membership and to also mentor young Liberals. He was, in fact, also a mentor for many in this place. Someone with so many years' experience outside of politics always has a great perspective to bring into the Senate. Jim was also a sought-after commentator for obvious reasons, particularly on national security and defence matters. Outside of this place, though, he had a great love of flying and held both fixed-wing and helicopter pilot licences. He also served his community as part of the Rural Fire Brigade. But as I stated at the beginning, Jim's greatest love of all was his family. And he celebrated 50 years of marriage to Anne in April of last year. It is never easy losing a life partner, but after 50 years together, I can't even begin to imagine what that is life like. In fact, so many said to me during my time of knowing Jim, it's not often in life that you meet two people and you can actually just feel they are soulmates. They have come together in this life. And that is something that people often said about Jim and Anne. They are true soulmates. Jim and Anne's marriage, of course, produced four wonderful children. And my condolences go to daughters Sarah, Erin and Felicity and son Michael, as well as his beautiful grandchildren, whom, as we all know, he just adored. We saw at Jim's funeral what a wonderful and close, tight-knit family you are and how your strong bond will help see you through this. Again, we are going to hear so often today just how proud Jim was of his family. And without a doubt, he was not shy in telling us that. There will always be a family within this place who will always be here for you all, ready to support and help you in any way we can. And finally, to Jim himself. Thank you, Jim, for your great service to this nation over many years. There are very few like you in this nation's history, but we should all hope that there will be more like you in our future. A finer example could not have been set. Rest in peace, Jim Mullen. Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much. Um, and an I appreciate the opportunity to make a brief contribution to this condolence motion honouring the life and service of Senator Jim Mullen. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging his family, friends and colleagues uh, who are feeling his loss uh, so deeply. In the loss of Senator Mullen, we have lost a truly national uh, figure, a national leader and, for me, as the senator for the ACT, a much-loved local from this Canberra region. At Senator Molan's funeral service, at the memorial service, I learned a lot more about the man that I served alongside of in this place, a man who had dedicated his entire career to public service in the Defence Force, in the Parliament, in the community and in the Liberal Party. He wore many hats. and I, At that funeral service, I was also struck by what an interesting and exciting life he had led and how he was at so many 
um, pivotal moments in Australia's um, national history and, and, in fact, in global history. Some describe, have described Jim even here today as a giant of a man. And when we use that to describe Jim, it's never meant just referring to his physical presence. I mean, if Jim was in a room, uh, in the room, you certainly knew about it, not just because you couldn't miss him, because he was often taller than everybody else in the room, but it was also because of his energy um, in that room. Um, people have spoken of the smile, and I think at the funeral service, about his, uh, the hand that reached out and said, hello, Jim Mullen, um, with a big smile, and I certainly remember that and could relate to that as well. But it wasn't just his energy, it was also his interest in whatever was going on. Uh, and I think people who um, are interested in others is an underrated quality uh, or often unrecognised, um, but it showed uh, the true character of a person with an open mind, prepared to learn, wanting to learn and also wanting to under, you know, know um, other people who he worked with. Um, and that's something that I will always uh, remember about Jim. Um, a couple of other things, I think, in this place, people often see publicly the, the arguments, the fight, the divisions. Um, what they don't often reflect on is the amount of time we spend together getting to know each other. And even though our politics might be different, we get in this chamber, the small nature of it, the small number of us, we get to spend time with each other, even if it is only during those five-minute divisions that seem to go on and on on some days. We spend time with each other. We get to know each other. And again, others have spoken today about um, Senator Molan's deep love of his family. And that was something, again, that stood out for me. Often when we'd sit together during a division and we'd turn to talk about our family, what was going on. And of course, you could not uh, mistake the, the deep, you know, the, the love he has uh, for Anne and for his children and stories of his grandchildren. Um, and so when people see us sometimes sitting side by side and laughing in this place, that's often what we are, are talking about. And again, it's, it's not an often recognised part of this job. The other thing I remember is um, always going out and being on the booths in Queanbeyan. And I think every time I would go out there, Jim Molan would be on the same booth. And I would think, how could this possibly be? There's so many booths and everyone I turn up to, Jim is there on the stump, getting in way of me trying to lobby voters. <laughs> but again, I think it's his energy and the fact that once he committed to something, he was there. And so uh, the work he did, and that's again, I think, the reason I'll, I'll remember Jim um, forever is the fact that we did do some of that campaigning together in Queanbeyan, uh, vying for the same voters often. Um, the other and, and one of the final things I want to say is um, Senator Birmingham and Senator Wong spoke about gratitude. And again, that is something that stands out to me um, in my dealings with Jim. And I remember after he was diagnosed with cancer and he'd gone through his first round of treatment he reached out to me uh, to express his gratitude for the services of the ACT health system. Uh, I thought that was a particularly generous thing to do when he was going through his own, um, you know, his own illness and dealing with that and the consequences of that, uh, that he took time out to reach out to me to acknowledge the Capital Region Cancer Centre um, and the staff at the Canberra Hospital and others uh, who had provided him with treatment. And again, that talks to the man that we all knew. Since his passing, um, Senator Molan has been remembered as a loyal servant uh, to the people of his community, the people of New South Wales and our country more broadly. And today, the Senate honours his service. Senator Molan dedicated his life to serving our nation through his many roles, with which he always served with distinction. I hope that this um, honour, this condolence motion today in the Senate offers his family some comfort. Um, the respect that with which he was held offers some comfort as they mourn a life taken too soon. Thank you. Senator Rustin. Thank you. 
In the 10 years that I've been in this place, I've had the privilege of meeting many very interesting and dedicated people, but at the very top of that list is Jim Molan. So it's both with sadness and deep respect that I stand today in this chamber to speak to the condolence motion of the passing of Senator Andrew James Jim Molan AODSC. Jim was a great friend, he was a great colleague, he was a great Australian. He's a true patriot and he served his country in so many ways, whether that be his 40 years of dedicated service in the military uh, to the security and safety of this country and its citizens as a former Major General or as the architect of Operation Sovereign Borders, where his actions saved the lives of undoubtedly many thousands of people who otherwise would have drowned at sea, or as a senator for New South Wales in this place since 2017, off and on. But on reflecting um, on his time as a senator, I'd describe Jim as a consistent conservative. Consistent because you would always know that the position that Jim would take on policies and politics was consistent with his values. He never took the easy path. He never took the convenient path. His positions were always authentic. And his delivery was always one of unwavering dignity and total sincerity. As a friend, he was thoughtful and he was generous with his time. And on a personal note, uh, there was never more clear that generosity than two years ago when my 90-year-old mother came to the parliament. Mum was delighted to meet the Prime Minister. She met many cabinet ministers. Um, she was delighted to be called out in this chamber by Senator Birmingham for, for being here and being, being my mum. She was delighted to meet Brendan Murphy, who was at the time the chief medical officer in charge of our response to the COVID pandemic. But her most cherished moment was the fact that Jim chased her down and said, G'day. And I've got to say, as an avid Sky watcher, my mother has never missed a Jim Molan performance on Sky ever since that day. Um, and one of her most treasured possessions is the signed copy of his book, Danger on Our Doorstep, which he sent to Mum with a lovely personal message. It meant so much to her, and she now regales her newfound knowledge of international strategic politics and China to anybody who will listen to it. Um, but it's gestures like this that I think speak to the character of the man, the fact that he was always thinking about other people and the generosity in which he delivered that. So I'm not sure whether this is being broadcast today, possibly it's not, but I can assure you that if it was, my mum would be sitting in front of the television right now listening to every single contribution. And Erin, I think my mum has actually transferred her media loyalty to you. But um, Jim leaves behind an enormous legacy to the people he touched, the beautiful family uh, that were devoted to him and the service that he gave to his country and the commitment he gave to every single person he came in touch with. So my sincere condolences to you, Anne, uh, to Sarah, Erin, Felicity and to Michael. I feel immensely honoured to have had the privilege of knowing your husband and your father, Vale, Jim Mullen. Senator Davy. Uh, thank you very much. I too rise to make a contribution on this condolence motion for Senator Jim Mullen. Um, as a former Defence Force uh, member myself, albeit um, Senator Mullen, Jim was full time. He was an officer and he was dedicated to for many, many years. I was a part-time army reservist and a non-commissioned officer. However, you couldn't have been in the Defence Force at the time without having heard of Jim Molan and having the utmost respect for the rank and the experience and the dedication that he had. But I don't want to focus on Jim's military service as monumental as it was, I, uh, I had the joy of um, being the person whose name appeared above his name on the 2019 Senate ticket. Um, so, as my colleague Senator Mackenzie said earlier, despite the way Jim first came into the parliament and our relationship with the Nationals, uh, we are firm friends. We always have been firm friends. Jim first came into this chamber um, on a constitutional countback 
uh, replacing my colleague, former Senator Fiona Nash, um, which, I'll be honest, it did rankle a few gnats who were saying, why have we got a Liberal taking what we saw as our seat? But it was a constitutional countback. It was all above board, and Jim, through no fault of his own, came into this place and served with honour. And then in 2019, through no fault of mine, uh, his name appeared below mine on our coalition Senate ticket, um, leading to uh, what was mentioned by Senator Wong, probably the largest below the, vote, uh, below the line vote we've ever seen in a uh, Senate election. He got 3 per cent of the vote, which was awesome. And so I need to personally thank him because uh, that huge vote um, made a significant contribution to ensuring that the coalition got three senators up in that election and I was one of them. So I'm very, very grateful to Jim, but I'm also grateful that he didn't give up. And I'm grateful that the Liberal Party saw fit to put him in uh, in November that very same year to replace the casual vacancy um, when Senator Arthur Sinodinus um, retired to take an overseas position. I didn't know what to expect when Jim came into this place while I was here, um, but what I met was an absolute consummate gentleman, such a beautiful and genuine man with such—we've talked about his smile, the smile that was absolutely infectious and contagious. He was a true optimist and also a team player. When I finally got to meet him and we had a little bit of a joke about um, him trying to beat me in the election, <laughs> and he just he grinned and he said, you know it wasn't personal, mate, you know it wasn't personal, and we became firm friends ever since. Because Jim, also a regional senator for New South Wales, um, we shared some duty electorates uh, and we crossed over in, in our representation of regional areas. So I also want to extend a massive thank you to Jim's staff, who were always so professional, so accessible and so loyal, which also shows what sort of a man Jim was himself, to, to have that level of, of loyalty um, and commitment from his staff. Even when Jim first fell ill, to an outsider looking in, you would not have known it, because Jim stayed engaged, he kept penning articles and op-eds, and his staff remained engaged. And um, they never stopped working for their constituency, for the people of New South Wales, and for the people of Australia. So I really want to thank the staff. My staff certainly appreciated um, the level of connections that we had. And um, last time I saw Jim, late last year when he came to our joint party room, and also when the um, uh, when our leader of the opposition, Peter Dutton, asked for all former service personnel to attend and have a photo together. Um, it was, I really appreciated being able to see Jim. He did not for one second give off the um, trials that he was personally going through. He still stood as tall as he's ever stood. He still smiled as broadly as he's ever smiled. And um, he didn't dwell on what he was going through. He asked about, you know, how are you doing? How's life in the Senate? Are we keeping them honest? And um, I, like Jim, I had really hoped that he would again go into remission. I had really hoped that he would again be here with us uh, doing his job, doing what you could tell he found very rewarding, um, that kept him busy and occupied, but it wasn't to be. So my condolences to Anne and to his family. I am so grateful that you allowed Jim the time 
to spend in this place with us. And I'm sure uh, I join all my colleagues in sending you our condolences. I'm sure he's at peace and he will not be forgotten. Thank you. Senator McAllister. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. Well, I, I too appreciate the opportunity to rise and speak on the occasion of the death of Andrew James Mullen, our respective colleague that we all knew as Jim. Compared to the other place over there, the Senate is actually quite a small place. And as others have observed this morning, it's a place characterised as much by collaboration as by conflict, notwithstanding the perceptions that people in public may have about how we work together. And of course, here we work together, we get to know people, and we get to understand them. I served briefly with Jim on the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, but I served for a much longer period uh, on the Select Committee on Foreign Interference through social media, where I was the chair and Jim was the deputy chair. Jim and I, of course, did not agree on everything or indeed many things. Uh, we come from very different political traditions. But in grappling with the challenges presented by new digital technologies, we found common cause. These are complex issues, and they sit at the intersection of technology, security, community and our democratic institutions. They're not simple, and they don't lend themselves to simple solutions. And Jim, in our committee work together, really lent into that complexity. As others have observed, he was not shy in questioning uh, government officials, officials representing his own government, because he was determined to get to the bottom of it, because he recognised the significance of the issue that we are examining to our public life. And we are aligned, I think, in understanding that our democratic institutions are, in fact, core pillars of our national security. And it was through that frame that Jim approached the work of the committee. He was often not well during the period of that committee's work, and it meant that we had to speak about how we would manage the work of the committee. But he was absolutely determined that the committee's work would go on, and he would make himself available whenever I needed him so that the work of the committee could continue. He was entirely dedicated to the work of the Senate and the job that the Senate had tasked us to do together. And I was really pleased that we were able to deliver an interim report with jointly sponsored recommendations. And of course, Jim, later, when he was in a position to do so, uh, added some of his own personal reflections uh, as additional comments at the back end of that report, which again demonstrate his deep engagement with the material that had been put before us. But perhaps more particularly for today, the, the daily experience of working with Jim was an absolute pleasure, of course. He was courteous, he was reasonable, he was generous, and perhaps most importantly, he understood the value of candid, serious, private discussions between colleagues. Jim and I, of course, reserved the right to vigorously disagree, and he was quite cross with me about some of the approaches that I took on climate change and his position on climate change. But he understood that there was deep value in collaboration. He knew that personal re relationships are the bedrock of such collaboration here, and I always knew that I could go to Jim with a personal or confidential disclosure and that he would respect that. This will be a time of enormous sadness for Jim's staff. He respected them and, he, and they respected him enormously. They are enormously fond of him and I offer my condolences uh, to all of the people who worked with him. We also, of course, spoke frequently of our families, that quiet moment where you can quietly share a little bit of pride about the progress of the people that you love the most through the world. To Anne, to his four children, his five grandchildren, his extended family and all the people who loved him, 
To you also, I offer my condolences. Valai Jim. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. I start uh, by quoting from one of my favourite poets, Khalil Gibran. God made the world with a heart full of love. Then he looked down from heaven above and saw that we all need a helping hand, someone to share with who will understand. He made special people to see us through the glad times and the sad times too. A person on whom we can always depend, someone we can call a friend. God made friends so we'll carry a part of his perfect love in all our hearts. And it struck me reading that the other day, what a perfect reflection that was of Jim. I did not uh, have the opportunity to get to know him as well as so many people um, because I more recently came into the Senate in the gap while Jim was out. Um, much has been said of his extraordinary career uh, with the Army, um, just a, an outstanding example of service. And it is a tragedy that often we get to know more about a person um, through attending their their funeral and hearing people speak of them. It did strike me, though, what an incredibly practical person he must have been as a leader too, um, ensuring that his troops could walk 80 kilometres in 24 hours with a 30-kilometre self-sufficient pack. Um, it must have been an inspiring uh, leadership to have men and women follow him. Uh, I also reflected on his retirement, which uh, was brief and um, and much uh, and just from the army, not from his service to the community, and uh, his service in the rural fire brigade. And I can only imagine the air firefighting service uh, just grabbing hold of his leadership and understanding of both the aviation and the practical element of, of um, physical defence of our land. Um, his below-the-line campaign was extraordinary, and I can assure you that whilst North Queenslanders couldn't vote for New South Wales senators, uh, they were very, very keen to. And I had to explain to lots of people that whilst they were passionate about seeing uh, Jim Molan elected to the Senate, unfortunately from Queensland, we couldn't help in that regard. But it was an extraordinary performance, extraordinary, and just a, a real sign of his personal um, leadership that he was able to attract so many people to vote for him. I think um, some of the things that I have marked Jim's time in the Senate was his incredible patriotism and his ability to convey to people that that was okay. At a time when um, we have uh, young people not sure if it's okay to celebrate Australia Day, that the Australian flag is not something that people feel that they, some people feel that they can muster around. And Jim was able to let people know that patriotism is something that you can be incredibly proud of and to embrace, and he lived that. Uh, he was an inspiration in the Senate because uh, he had this incredible capacity, as all, has already been commented on, uh, to never seem rushed, to always feel considered, that he always had time to speak to you. And um, he shared stories with me of his time in the army that um, were just fantastic and, and a reflection of his views on, um, on, on the practical nature of leadership and the way the army works both then and now and, of course, um, some uh, very funny uh, observations, but I won't share those here. He was a man of such strong and clearly defined morals. And I will always remember uh, a day when we were um, preparing for the chamber and there was a discussion about somebody and there was a, a, a view put that this person had no choice but to follow their heart, that this was outside of their, their control. And his comments were short and very sharp and to the point that your morals and, your, and your, your decisions are always your own. And I thought that was a view that we do not hear enough. And I was, I was, I was taken aback and, and also incredibly pleased to hear his incredibly strong moral standard. He was a man that you would go to war with, quite literally. But he epitomised a sense of respect for people 
not forced, not manufactured, not around uh, any particular values. I just think he liked people, he respected them, and that sense of compassion and acknowledgement of humans um, I really valued. An incredible sense of good humour. Um, it's not always reflected in here. Uh, sometimes people can be uh, short and, and, um, and take their, their team's view uh, very strongly, but Jim always managed to find his sense of humour and the sense of gratitude. And at the end of it all, character is what marks our lives. And Jim's was, uh, he was a man of incredible character, a man of integrity, of courage, of morals, of conviction. And of course, that gift of gratitude, um, I think that is something that I have reflected on a lot since the service a couple of weeks ago. Um, I hope that, that I can carry that on. I thought that is a beautiful way to think about your life in a very on a daily way. Um, he was a man to be admired as an Australian, as a senator, but of course most importantly as a family man. We share your loss and today we hope in some way to share a little of the pain, of the, the burden that you carry. And I hope in time the wonderful memories of Jim as a man will replace that sense of pain. My condolences to you, his family, to his friends, importantly to his staff, and, uh, and I say vale to a life incredibly well lived to Jim Molan. Thank you. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And it is an immense honour and privilege to be able to make a contribution uh, to commemorate the life and indeed the contribution that our friend and colleague Jim Mullen made uh, in his time on this earth. Um, we've heard it through the contributions of colleagues here today, uh, the extensive reflections that uh, were in the media um, after his passing, those beautiful testimonials of his beloved family and his friends uh, at the celebration of his life. And of course, importantly, the recitation of that immense record of service at the end of the ceremony uh, last week, um, highly decorated and something to behold, truly. Uh, all of these things paint a picture of a man um, who was amazing in every respect and one that I can say on behalf of my colleagues I know uh, had a great privilege in serving with, and we are grateful for that. Um, for those who had the privilege to work with Jim, we could see proof of everything that was written about him from his time in the Defence Force, uh, in authoring um, Operation Sovereign Borders, his role as a father and a husband, all of those things came home to us when we were able to work with him, be it on Senate committees or here in this chamber. It was clear to us that he was a decent and honourable man, two words that are sometimes hard to apply to people we know, but certainly in the case of Jim, we could do that. He was a man also of conviction and um, very much of compassion. Jim's credentials have all been very well established through the things we've heard and that we've read. As a leader in our defence forces, uh, as I said before, the author of the successful uh, border protection policy we've talked about here, as an authority on national security, uh, but uh, also as a father and as a husband um, and an active member of his community. My dealings with Jim, though, were around him being a strong and active act, uh, advocate for his community, particularly when it came to matters forestry. And um, it's sometimes said, though, in this place, and I think very unfairly that senators can be seen as out of touch with their community. Now, I think all of us here would agree that is not the case, but certainly in the case of Jim, he was very much in touch, um, and especially when it came to matters that impacted the regional communities he represented across the state of New South Wales, and in particular on this very important industry, forestry. And it's when I worked with him on matters forestry that I saw all of these things people have been talking about uh, on this niche issue, an important one, but all of those characteristics that have been used here to describe Jim and his passion, his commitment, uh, came um, to the surface and were on full display. Um, after the disastrous black summer bushfires, um, Jim put his full force into uh, doing his best to help a community suffering the impact of bushfires. And I remember he invited me down to his patch 
uh, to come and have a look at the damage of the bushfires, quite extensive, particularly when it came to forestry, but also other parts of the economy as well. And indeed, uh, all of the communities that were affected suffered greatly. But one meeting that we did go to stands out to me in my memory. And I recall Jim, who uh, was always known and has been talked about quite extensively here, and I didn't realise that that would be the case, but uh, always known to be smiling and exhibiting this warmth and putting people at ease, um, was very much smiling the day of this meeting. And we arrived at this meeting of farmers in the community of Lower Bago. And as the meeting started, it dawned on me why Jim was smiling so much. Um, at the time, I thought, well, he's happy to be spending the day with me. But uh, as the meeting got underway, it was in fact because these less than happy farmers had discovered they had fresh blood. Uh, and for once in his life, he was able to probably uh, watch on as someone else took the hits. But in all seriousness, though, at that meeting, these farmers who had felt abandoned by successive state and federal governments, uh, by other industries that had become uh, a greater priority to government, um, he was able to give them voice. He was able to uh, seek to find ways to resolve the problems they were facing. That visit demonstrated to me, and in particular that meeting demonstrated to me something Senator Birmingham talked about before, that relentlessness, the commitment and the consistency that he applied to clearly every element of what he did. And despite the difficult nature of that meeting, and it did get a little heated, I don't think I left with many friends that day, uh, apart from Jim, um, it was clear that Jim was intent on ensuring that those farmers, like the rest of his community, every day that he served in this place, uh, the people he fought for got the answers they deserved and the solutions and support they needed. And while Jim was allocating so much energy to significant matters like national security, our nation's defences, no matter was too small or too trivial. And indeed, uh, again in the area of forestry, it was Jim's hard work that spearheaded the securing of funding for uh, the Eden Forestry Hub, something that will um, secure the future of that industry for years to come and the hundreds of jobs that depend on that industry in small communities that don't, don't often get talked about here in Canberra but rely on us for leadership uh, and for our backing. And Jim did his bit. He was relentless in his phone calls until he was able to make an announcement with funding and he secured it for them. He has an amazing legacy and that is just a small part of it. Jim was also a generous man and uh, much has been said of the Below the Line campaign and I recall there was a time where a, an article surfaced in the Tasmanian media about me perhaps finding myself in the third spot on the Tasmanian Liberal ticket. And Jim, with that smile we mentioned before, pulled me aside in the corridor just outside our offices and said, Jono, I've been in this situation before. Perhaps you and I should have a cup of coffee and I can give you a few pointers. <laughs> now, thankfully, I didn't have to draw on his knowledge and experience, but it is one great regret because I would love to know how Jim Molan managed to secure the number of votes that he did um, in the way that he did in that campaign. One regret, as I say, I will always have. Listening to Jim's first speech um, back in February of 2018, it was his reference to Psalm 144 and his view about the Judeo-Christian culture that we have in this country that struck me most and how it has made Australia the country it is in terms of facing adversity and challenges. Jim's attitude towards challenge and adversity was something to behold and something that many of us in this place wish we could replicate. It was something that clearly set him apart from so many. We're grateful to Jim for his service. We're grateful particularly to his family for sharing him with us. And I offer my condolences to his family and his team who are here today. Vale Jim Mullen. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I uh, too wish to rise and uh, express my condolences to the family. I was deeply saddened the day I heard the news that Senator Molan <clears throat> had passed. It's interesting working in the Senate and one of the things that I do love about working in the Senate is the opportunity to get to know people uh, from all walks of life uh, with different viewpoints. Uh, with opposing views, uh, with agreeable views, but always with respect. And I certainly found that with Senator Molan. I was uh, with quite
quite a few people with the Defence Force in the Northern Territory uh, at the time we received the news. And I would like to just uh, put on the record that um, the Defence Personnel of the Northern Territory are with you as well in your grief. He touched the lives of many people. I certainly did not know uh, Senator Molan before he joined the Senate, but I was very aware of the work that he did do. And I'd like to, if I may, just uh, to, to Anne, uh, if I may uh, read to you and to your children, Michael, Felicity, Erin and Sarah, just some of the words from a retired sergeant from the Northern Territory, a message from Robert Richards. My recollections of Jim Molan were from his time as the commander, First Brigade at Robertson Barracks in Darwin. When there was an opportunity to talk with him, usually at a brigade function or event, no matter what rank you were, from the command teams of the units of the brigade to the lower levels of the food chain, he would take the time to listen to what you had to say and then, after a few moments of consideration, would respond to your comments and correct you where you were wrong and or out of your lane, but also would agree with some of the things you had said if they had some merit. He was truly a great man and understood the needs of the soldiers under his command. It was a great honour to have worked under him in the 1st Brigade and have been given the opportunity to talk with him on a few occasions. He will be very sorely missed, not only by his family but by Australia as a whole, due to his love and care for the family and the country. May he rest in peace. My warmest regards, Robert Richards, Sergeant, retired. I'd also like to point out uh, my time uh, with Senator Molan, and that was really through the stillbirth inquiry, which I chaired uh, in, in 2017-18. And uh, it was through that time that I had the chance to really get to know him as we travelled across uh, the states and territories, listening to families tell their stories, asking for assistance in how our policies at a federal level could assist all families going forward. And it was at the time when I delivered the report here in the Senate, and I brought, it, brought the report in on a Kooloman. And under our way, and certainly for the Yanyuan Garwa, we used the Kooloman to carry our babies, to carry water, um, to carry life. And by bringing the Kooloman in, an empty Kooloman in was symbolic for all those families across Australia who had lost a baby, but all those families who had the courage to speak to us. And Erin, your dad was just so beautiful throughout that whole process. And if I may, I'd just like to read uh, his response to the report here in the Senate. And, um, and I know it was a difficult time. I'd just like to read a couple of paragraphs from his speech here. Today I stand in this place as a former soldier, not unfamiliar with death and violence, as a senator for New South Wales who has devoted much of my time to national security and as an ordinary Australian returning to the workplace after a five-month period of medical treatment in which the magnificent healthcare professionals and health services of this nation essentially saved my life. For the good wishes I received from you, my colleagues, I thank you most sincerely. However, I am absolutely incapable of thinking of any sentiment more important to me today or of any commemoration more significant than to mourn the cherished children whose loss through miscarriage, stillbirth and infant death is suffered each year by thousands of Australian families. I was honoured to be a member of the Senate Select Committee on Stillbirth Research and Education, which in 2018 examined in great detail the significant and far-reaching impacts of stillbirth in Australia. I welcome the National Stillbirth Action and Implementation Plan, published in December last year and developed under the oversight of the National Stillbirth Project Reference Group, again established by the then Australian Health Minister's Advisory Council. But I think most poignantly, Senator Molan's heartfelt comments were for his daughter and granddaughter. 
On Wednesday last week, my stillborn granddaughter, Emily Charlotte Sutton, would have turned 14, but instead we commemorated the 14th anniversary of her shattering death. On Friday last week, her mother, my daughter Sarah, turned 40, a milestone birthday. It wasn't celebrated with family and friends, but only because of COVID health orders in all states. That was from a speech on the 18th of October 2021 when we remembered the International Pregnancy and Infant Loss Remembrance Day. And I'd just like to say to the Molan family, it is because of uh, Senator Molan's work uh, with me on the stillbirth inquiry uh, that I felt I had the pleasure of getting to really know him. And my heartfelt condolences go out to you all and to his staff. Yo, Bawajibara. Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. I rise to add my voice to the Chamber's condolence for our colleague and our friend Jim Molan and to extend my sympathies to his family, his friends and to the many, many people who loved and admired him. Jim Molan was very much a man who lived his values in the service of his country. And I'm pleased to say that Jim was, in fact, born a Victorian, but somehow he was led astray and went over the border, ending up a senator for New South Wales. And in between, Jim, of course, travelled the world in his service to, of those who needed help and in the service of his country. On entering this place, he commented that he had been a lifelong believer in democracy, in both concept and in practice. And many of us here might be of the view that we are the same as Jim in this regard. We are not. Unlike Jim, while we might stand in this place and deliver high-principled speeches or provide opinions on how others should follow the values that we represent, Jim walked a different path. In uniform, Jim departed Australia in the service of his country to try and ensure that people he had never met could provide for themselves a self-determined life of freedom and democracy. Over decades across Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, East Timor, the Solomons and in Iraq, Jim went to serve. Australia couldn't hope for a better emissary than Jim Molan, a big man with an even bigger heart. He saw his role in these deployments and postings as an opportunity for Australia to walk with others on their own path to democracy and all the opportunities and the prosperity that it had given him. At the end of a long and storied career, which included an Order of Australia, a Distinguished Service Cross, a Legion of Merit from the United States, Jim didn't stop serving. He decided that he would take his career of experience and apply it to public life, first through policy and finally through politics. I'm not entirely sure whether anyone had mentioned to him that there is no such thing as the continuous service cross. If politics is a vocation, it's fair to say that Jim got the call late, but having been called, he didn't waste a moment. He didn't forget the lessons of his time in uniform and he would march across his state and put into practice all the democratic values that he had previously hoped for, for others and other countries with an outstretched hand and an open mind, everywhere from country shows to committee hearings. He found that no amount of committee work was too great and no issue too small. And in particular, I know he will be remembered for his work on that Senate Select Committee into Stillbirth Research and Education, which Senator McCarthy referred to, of which he was the deputy chair. This obviously was a matter of such, um, that was so personal to him, having experienced the loss of a granddaughter in 2007. And while Senator McCarthy has already uh, read to the chamber some of his comments that day, I might add to that the part that most moved me. Senator Molan said that the recommendations of this report will spare many Australian parents from the unimaginable grief of your baby going to the hospital mortuary instead of the nursery, of making autopsy arrangements, of postnatal mothers being supported to walk through a cemetery to choose a plot for their baby, of a funeral with the smallest of white coffins being carried by a shell-shocked family member and of returning home to a house full of baby paraphernalia, 
And that's just the blur of the first week or 10 days. Having found strength to do all of this, Sarah, Gavin, all of our witnesses at this inquiry and every other traumatised, bereaved parent then has to find the strength to get out of bed and to function every day for the rest of their lives. That was a contribution that left not a dry eye in the chamber, and it was a reminder to us all that in this crazy job that requires such a thick skin, that vulnerability and an admission of it is a demonstration of strength and not weakness. You've heard loud and clear today that he was a much-loved colleague. And although he was a latecomer, he was very much adopted, indeed embraced, by the class of 2016. And although he came with such a, a somewhat intimidating, intimidating uh, reputation, he was just so likeable. He fit in immediately and, uh, and was always the first to join his colleagues in that group and in its gatherings. Personally, I, I loved the fact that he would refer to me as one of the young members of the 2016 cohort. Um, not too many places or people refer to me as young these days, so I'm very happy. And I had, uh, just as a matter of courtesy, I'd never corrected him on that. As we, stop laughing, Senator Patterson. As we recall what Jim meant to his colleagues, I also want to acknowledge what Jim meant to his staff, his wonderful team who reflected the values and behaviours of their boss, their hard work, their professionalism, their admiration and loyalty was and is unquestionable. As a soldier, Jim was witness to some of the worst of humanity's failings. He could have been forgiven if he had have become hardened or bitter or angry or cynical. But it speaks volumes of the man that instead he was quite the opposite. He was courteous, he was generous, he was open-minded, and as we were reminded at that beautiful funeral, he was grateful. His funeral was a fitting tribute to a brave soldier, a selfless contributor, and a good man. The litany of achievements, the stories of heroism, and the yarns of friendship that flowed constantly and freely were food for the soul. But what most moved me was those photos, oh, those photos, over and over, passing years, each in turn showing service to his nation and love of his family. My thoughts go out to his family, of whom he spoke to us often, to Annie and Erin and Felicity, Sarah, Michael and those beautiful grandchildren who were clearly so desperately loved. How lucky! How lucky we all are to have shared our time on this earth with a man who did what we all wanted to do, to live a life that makes a difference. So vale to our dear friend, Senator Jim Molan, a man whose trumpet never sounds retreat. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I rise to make a short contribution in tribute to my friend and our former colleague, Senator Jim Molan. And in doing so, I acknowledge his family, uh, his friends, his former staff who are with us uh, here today on what I know is another difficult day in the last couple of very difficult weeks in their life. Uh, I want to associate myself with the very fine words of other senators who have spoken already in this debate, um, particularly Senator Birmingham and Senator Wong. It is a wonderful tribute to Jim as a person that he has been so warmly remembered by people from both sides of this chamber, and it is a reflection on the very fine way in which he conducted himself here. I won't repeat his very distinguished CV and record of service, except to note what a rare and remarkable and amazing thing it is to have someone who's dedicated almost every single day of his life in the service of his nation. Uh, from in, in uniform uh, to civil society organisations and ultimately here in this place, Jim lived a life for others and for his country. And that is a great act of uh, selfless contribution to our country, for which we should be very grateful and for which he should be very warmly remembered, and for which I hope his family is very proud, uh, because it's an astonishing legacy and example that he sets for all of us. Jim and I were collaborators in this place uh, on issues of national security. We were both concerned about the strategic circumstances that our country finds ourselves in. 
and the perspective and the authority and the credibility that Jim brought to those debates and those public conversations were just so important. Uh, he is in very large part uh, to be credited for the very significant change in posture that Australia has adopted in the last five years, to take much more seriously the threats that we face as a country and to see the world as it is rather than we might prefer it to be, to accept the reality of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. I've been reflecting over the last two weeks about the best tribute that we can pay to Jim, the best way in which we can honour his service. And I think it is by continuing his life's passion and his life's work as best we can. Uh, we will be imperfect custodians of his legacy because none of us can replicate uh, his uh, record of service and insight, but we can do our very best to carry on his uh, progress and his mission. And I know Jim was uh, gratified and grateful and proud and pleased of the progress that our country has made, particularly over the last five years in uh, readying ourselves for the period of conflict that we know is a possibility that will come in the future. But I know he was also dissatisfied that that progress wasn't far enough, that it wasn't swift enough, it wasn't comprehensive enough. And I know to his very last days he was agitating for more and faster and swifter and more comprehensive action to make sure that our country is resilient and can navigate uh, the tumultuous times that we suspect we will face in the decades to come. And Jim was absolutely right to view the national security challenges we face as a country holistically, to understand that it's not just about the capability or the kit that our defence forces are able to acquire, uh, but about our whole of nation resilience and readiness uh, to survive a period of conflict. He was right to call out weaknesses like our failure to ensure we have sufficient uh, liquid fuel stocks here on shore in Australia, and he was persistent in raising that and gained very significant uh, and welcome progress, but I know in his view insufficient progress, and that must be continued. Jim had a very deep understanding that the prosperity and the harmony, har harmony and the democracy that we enjoy here is historically rare and fragile that there's nothing preordained or guaranteed about it being passed on to future generations, that there's no certainty of that, and that the only way that we can ensure that that happens is if we ensure it happens, that we work assiduously at that task. And so I think it is important that we carry on his vision, uh, that we heed the lessons particularly of his book, Danger on Our Doorstep, which really was uh, to wake us up out of the complacency that developed in some quarters in our country in recent decades, to get people to appreciate the very serious challenges uh, that we face and the very uh, dangerous circumstances that we live in, and to respond accordingly and with the necessary um, drive and uh, action uh, required to meet it. Uh, I want to finish by reflecting, as others had, on Jim's personality. Um, as, as many senators have noted, he was a, a, a warm and generous and funny and decent man. And he was, in many ways, a happy warrior. Uh, he, he was a warrior for his cause and for the issues that he cared about, but he never allowed himself to be downcast or depressed or negative about it, even when he was battling very serious uh, health challenges for many years. Uh, the fact that he was able to, to write uh, a, a wonderful and important book, uh, which I commend to all Australians, while receiving uh, treatment for cancer is an extraordinary feat of personal resilience and strength that uh, I think we can all draw inspiration from. And it was that sunny disposition, it was that warm and friendly uh, nature of his that I admired most despite the challenges he faced in his own life and, about, and despite the seriousness of the issues that he worked on. And I hope we can honour that part of his legacy too as senators and continue to conduct ourselves in the way that he would have hoped that we would, um, with decency and courtesy and, and politeness while also tackling the very big challenges that we face. Uh, so thank you, Jim. Thank you for the life of service that you have given to our country. Thank you to your family who lent you uh, to our country for 72 years. Thank you for the impact and legacy that you leave, and we will do our best to honour it. Senator Billick. Thank you. I too rise to join my colleagues in acknowledging the service of former Senator Jim Mullen, AO, DSC. And I'm just going to make a few, uh, few comments today, a fairly short contribution but I would also like to associate myself with the previous comments made by others. While many senators have so far reflected on various aspects of Senator Mulden's service, including his extensive de defence work and his national security work, I, like Senator McCarthy, really want to focus on the work we did together on the Select Committee on Stillbirth Research and Education, along with Senator McCarthy and Rice and former Senator Christina Keneally. 
This was the only committee I served on with um, Senator Marlan. And like me, he had been touched by the tragedy of stillbirth, having lost a grandchild who was born still in 2007. This was a tragic event for his family, particularly his daughter and her husband. But it did give, I, I believe, it gave um, Senator Mullen a perspective on stillbirth that made his contribution to the inquiry all the more valuable. And as the only male on the committee, I don't think there could have been a better rep from the other side. As Senator McCarthy and others have said, in this place, working on committees together, you get to know people and you get to understand them. And although I'd been here for a very long time, as I said, this was the only committee I worked on with Senator Mullen. And prior to that committee, I'd always thought, he's a happy, he's a happy guy. This guy is a happy guy. Um, he would always say hello to you in the corridors. He would always have a smile. Uh, and that never, ever changed from the, from the minute he was here. Um, that's how I always thought of him. I didn't know him that well. Um, uh, and then we did the stillbirth committee, which was a bit of a, um, a challenge to some of us. Um, and, but it was a pleasure to have Senator Mullen on that inquiry. Uh, although it was such a tragic and heartbreaking subject. And we did listen to witnesses who were traumatised and grieving. Uh, and Senator Mullen, along with the other members of the committee, were all hugely respectful and considerate and caring uh, of, of those um, witnesses. I thought the compassion, the thoughtfulness, the humility that Senator Mullen demonstrated throughout the inquiry was highly admirable. And I firmly believe this is how he was in life. And listening to other people today, I think I'm right in having that view. Like the other senators on the, that inquiry, Senator Mullen understood that it was a tough conversation to confront, but one that Australia had to have. And it was a conversation that forced some of us, including him and myself, to at times relive painful memories. Nevertheless, the work was done. And it was done collegiately. Um, whether it was Labor, Liberal or the Greens, I think that committee and the, and the people on that committee uh, truly showed the parliament at its best. I've been here 15 years. I've got to say, I think that committee really did show the parliament at its best. And I would like to thank Senator Mullen for his truly valuable contribution to that effort. Senator Mullen's advocacy for supporting families affected by stillbirth and for reducing rates of stillbirth in Australia didn't just start and end with the inquiry. He, he continued that work um, after as well. As I said, we weren't close friends, and, but he was friendly to everyone. It was in his whole nature. Um, and he would, as I said, he was always smile and say hello when passing me in the corridor. And I did find out that his birth name was Andrew. His first name was Andrew. I used to think it was James and he was just called Jim, but then I found out it was Andrew. And so I would always greet him in the corridors with hello, Andrew. And he would always laugh. He would always have a smile and he'd always respond very um, cordially back to me, hello, Senator Billick. But I would always say to him, hello, Andrew. Um, he always took it in good humour. And Senator Marlin and I do belong to a very select group of people. Um, I'm a cancer survivor. Well, I'm in remission, um, as everybody in this place knows. So I didn't actually really talk to Senator Marlin about his illness all that much, but I can, can I say that the courage and the um, just, just staying on top of it takes a lot of personal courage. Just being able to get up some mornings takes a lot of personal courage, even when you're in remission. Uh, and so f from that perspective, I, I just could take my hat off to him for always being cheery. I'm not like that. Some days I'm just like, you know, why me? And of course the question is why not me? But um, I don't think Jim 
was ever like that. Certainly, I don't think anybody in this place ever saw him like that. So, um, I do take my, my hat off to him for that. I would like to convey my sincere condolences to Senator Mulvan's family, his friends, his former staff. Um, it's pretty hard work, I think, when something like this happens to your boss. And I know that um, through the stillbirth inquiry how much respect he had for his staff and they had for him. To his family, I'll just say I knew him as a kind, considerate and passionate gentleman. Um, you are no doubt proud of his legacy and deservedly so. I hope you have very fond memories of him and I hope they help you at this very sad time. Valet Jim Mullen. Senator McGrath. On behalf of Queenslanders and the Queensland Liberal National Party, may I pay my respects to the late Jim Mullen, his family, his staff and his, and his many, many, many friends. Let life not be measured by length of words or speeches, but by service. And Jim Mullen served. Jim Mullen served God, Queen and country. He served our Liberal cause. He served with distinction that our, today, that our words today, no matter how worthy, will but touch. As a patriot, a patriot who served the crusade for freedom as a soldier, diplomat, leader and author, a general who, as he rose through the ranks, never forgot those who worked with him on that path. Senator Molan forgot more about the strategic challenges facing Australia than most would ever learn, not that he forgot much. As a senator, a parliamentarian who saw his role as a protector, defender and fighter for and of the values that built Australia and actually within his own party, the Liberal Party of New South Wales. As humble as he was passionate, polite as he was steely, as funny as he was thoughtful, full of the joys of life, no matter what life threw at him, Jim lived with gratitude for that life and for his family. We are thankful for his sacrifices and that of his family. Australia is poorer, much poorer, with the passing of Senator Molan. We honour his service as a servant leader, and it is up to all of us in this place to deliver on the legacy of Senator Molan and the words and speeches that we have delivered today. Senator Smith. Thank you very much. The loss of our friend and senator, Jim Molan, was felt in every corner of the Liberal Party. I join with my Senate colleagues and all West Australian Liberals in recognising the loss and the life of a great Australian, a devoted parliamentarian. Jim Molan was a man who understood in a deep sense what it means to be committed to the service of our nation. Having spent 40 years in the military, being deployed to six countries and taking numerous leadership roles, Jim placed his life on the line for the advancement of Australia and its security. In his role as a commander, he shouldered the responsibility of protecting the lives of ADF personnel leading from the front. He was rightly honoured as an officer in the Order of Australia for his dedication alongside other accolades, including the Distinguished Service Cross and the United States Legion of Merit. Since his untimely passing, many have spoken on his storied career in the military, his professionalism and his skill. Today, I add my voice to theirs. But it is pertinent to remember that, remember that Jim's time in the military was not the full story of his love of our country and of his community. He was a devoted senator, rightly known for his dedication to values and integrity, and continuing his responsibilities in this place with great professionalism, even during illness. Jim was also an author, having written three books, all of them related to Australia's national security and military capacity. He wrote on his time in Iraq, making candid assessments of mistakes made in that conflict, as well as the general structure of the ADF. 
In doing so, he revealed his honesty, willing to call out failings and errors in the interests of Australia's protection and prosperity. Jim understood that without self-critique, there is no growth. And that is true for people, institutions and nations. I had the opportunity to share with Jim following the publication of his most recent book, Danger on Our Doorstep, a warning and risk assessment analysis of some of the major security threats for Australia and the Southeast Asian region. It now remains as one of his last acts of service to our country. Jim's writing was testament to his intellect, a tool he also employed during his contributions to Parliament. He was instrumental in the development of the Coalition's government's Operation Sovereign Borders policy and throughout his time in the Senate defended Australia's security interests with great energy. Jim was also a regular and respected contributor to The Australian and a frequent commentator on several political talk shows. It is a testament to his work ethic that a little, little over two weeks before he passed away, Jim was interviewed on live television to discuss security matters in the Taiwan Strait. As the opposition leader noted in his remarks at Jim's funeral, despite all the extreme conditions Jim would have endured in his career in the military and the many challenging circumstances he faced, he remained a kind and considerate man. The relationship between senators and chief whips can be eclectic, <laughs> enigmatic, <laughs> joyous, less joyous, but always one of discretion and trust. I am grateful for the trust and moments of honesty that Jim shared with me. His example of lifelong leadership is one for all of us to follow, one of disciplined service, devotion to country and love for family. To him, to whom I send my best and most sincere wishes. May we all honour his legacy by our own actions in this place. Vale, Jim Mullen. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And uh, I want to associate myself with the remarks of all those who have preceded me in this uh, discussion of the condolence motion. And I rise uh, particularly proud as a senator for New South Wales, having served alongside Senator Jim Molan. I um, can certainly say that he found himself in many situations of conflict and challenge. Uh, and even in these latter years, he, as a servant of democracy, that pattern of conflict and challenge was part of his life on his way into and his retention in the Senate. And not for a moment did he ever resile from that conflict. In fact, I think he had the character to embrace it and to understand very, very deeply uh, what service of your nation means and that that service can happen in many different contexts. Indeed, it's a sad day, but I am honoured to rise to acknowledge the great life and the works of Senator Jim Moland, AODSC, former a Major General in the proud Australian Army. I want to take this opportunity, uh, this sad opportunity, to pay tribute to him and his lifetime of service to the country, uh, in, uh, particularly his service in the, in the cause of democracy, which was operational in the very different parts of his life. Uh, also, his care and affection for his family. Uh, not everybody reveals that in this place, but it was absolutely a characteristic of Senator Molan, um, and I think it's an indication of incredible strength and a sense of. Um, how proudly he served the nation uh, with your grace and through and for you as a family. And I want to honour your sacrifice in enabling that uh, because he certainly was supported by you in his time here. Um, many have spoken about Jim's life, but he invested everything of his energy in every day, and I think it bears some repetition on this occasion. Born in that August year, 1951, Following his upbringing in Victoria, he joined the Australian Army in 1971, a very different time from that of today, where young men and women are joining uh, Duntroon and beginning their careers. He served for 40 years in our armed services, including as Chief of Operations in Iraq, where he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, as well as the, as the Legion of Merit by the United States government. 
His service also took him to postings in Asia, uh, about which he gained incredible cultural and significant practical knowledge that he used then to inform his interactions in this place. Time was spent in Timor, in Jakarta, Papua New Guinea and with the Australian Defence College, um, and he left the Army with the final rank of Major General. I didn't know Jim in any of those roles. I only met him when he arrived here into the Senate in 2017. Uh, and it was a time of tumult uh, where the parliament was ruled by the eligibility crisis. And immediately Jim arrived, um, perhaps in the way only uh, somebody who had served with his level of distinction in the armed services could. He certainly made his mark very promptly on arrival. His tenacity and his own prodigious resume ensured that despite many political setbacks, that for others uh, would have uh, led to their uh, retreat, Senator Molan continued his advance in the service of democracy and he was returned to this place by the voters of New South Wales in 2022. Senator Jim Molan should have spent the next six years richly deserved, quietly making his valuable impact on policy making for our nation. And I know that he would have enjoyed in between that contribution to the nation great continuing relationships and time with his family. We will miss him, but they will miss him so much more. I enjoyed uh, Jim's insights and our dis many discussions after attending the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade. Uh, I always was intrigued by his line of questioning and um, as somebody who's outside the military, I think he was a little intrigued by some of my questioning as well. And that led to great conversations. Jim was very generous with his insights and he was very frank and open in his assessments. Jim was very compassionate and deeply personally involved in the stillbirth inquiry. And as uh, the comments today give testament to, he is very remembered very fondly and very well by the colleagues who worked with him on that particular uh, inquiry. And I note the comments of Senator Billick, who was on that inquiry with, in, with him. Uh, apart from his insightful and deeply knowledgeable contributions regarding national security and defence policy, Jim was just a man who had a sense of how policy can impact family and impact on the people that he'd served with. And I think he took that into great care and concern as he gave each issue its due consideration. Jim's leadership, his, his stalwart patriotism and affability were a credit to the chamber and the nation. In fact, um, one evening, just as a mark of the man, I remember it was at the end of a long sitting of uh, estimates, uh, which sees senators wandering the corridors a little exhausted after 11pm in the evening. And Jim had returned from having surgery on his hip. Uh, and as he was walking along the corridor, um, I spoke to him and I said, you, you look like you're recovering really, really well from your operation. And his equanimity in response, his sense of um, determination just to get on with the recovery and continue with his job, um, revealed his unflappability. And I just I re recall that conversation quite fondly because it was a bit of a joke and a bit of a laugh at the end of a very long day. Uh, and as uh, Senator Billick indicated, I never for one moment saw a sort of self-pity as a Jim tackled the health challenges that confronted him uh, and the quality of his contributions over that period of time never diminished. And these things are not only, as I said, a testament to his character, but also something that I'm sure the family will be very, very proud of. Um, and I'm sure he'll see that continue that great tradition and education about how to be a great citizen continue in the rest of the family as you continue his legacy. I pass my deepest condolences on to Jim's wife, Anne, uh, to your and Jim's four children and five grandchildren. I pray and indeed I know that his memory is a blessing and that his lifetime of service to this great nation and this parliament has left a, rounding, a resounding legacy of which you can be rightly proud. Vale, Jim Mullen. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Chandler. Thank you. I rise, rise to pay respect to an upstanding member of the Liberal Party, a dedicated representative of New South Wales and a distinguished Major General, Andrew James Mullen, AODSC, who we all knew as Jim. Senator Molan's passing is being felt around this chamber and in this parliament by all of us who knew him and by the Australian community who so greatly admired him and his lifetime of dedicated service to our nation. 
As a representative in the Senate for New South Wales, Jim was a champion for his state, a man of honour who worked with distinction to serve the interests of his community. He was a proud Liberal, but above all, he was a proud Australian and a fierce defender of our national sovereignty, both in the parliament and in his distinguished career in our armed forces. Jim will be remembered as one of Australia's most important voices in speaking up eloquently and persuasively about the increasing security threats Australia faces and the need for us to more urgently prepare for those threats. Jim's deep knowledge and understanding of the issues of national security and Australia's armed force capabilities stem from his time serving in our defence forces, where he attained the rank of Major General in the Australian Army. With a number of published works to his name, the breadth of Jim's expertise made him a highly respected voice on such matters. His final book, published just last year, Danger on Our Doorstep, made a sobering assessment of the challenges to regional and global security posed by an increasingly aggressive Chinese Communist Party. On a personal level, I was honoured to have worked with Jim on the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee and I always deeply valued his wisdom and the guidance that he provided to me. And I think I will continue to value uh, that wisdom and guidance uh, in retrospect from here. His passion and his single-minded focus on issues of national security proved to be an invaluable asset when it came to scrutinising Australia's defence policy and military capability. It was a measure of Jim's character and dedication to Australia that, despite his ill health, he attended Senate estimates in November last year and asked a series of questions about our nation's defence capabilities that were, as usual for Jim, incisive, pertinent and deeply relevant to Australia's future challenges. In the years ahead, I and I'm sure many of my colleagues in the Liberal Party will do our best to continue Jim's legacy by asking the questions that Jim would have asked and speaking openly and without spin about the threats that Australia faces and what we need to do to counter them. He was a good friend to all of us, a mentor to many, and a voice of reason within our party room and the parliament, and I know that he will be deeply missed. I extend my sincere condolences to Jim's family, uh, particularly those who are here today, who I know have lost a loving husband, father and grandfather. Rest in peace, Jim. And thank you for your service. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Askew. Thank you. <clears throat> it is with sadness that I rise today to pay tribute to Senator Jim Molan, AO, DSC. He was a true gentleman, a trusted colleague and a friend. Leader of the Opposition, Peter Dutton, said Jim was admired for his discernment, leadership and unfailing courteous manner, and the Prime Minister described Jim as a man of principle and a politician of conviction. These apt summations of Jim's personality, work ethic and attitude to life are words I have been reflecting upon since his death. Many in this chamber have already spoken with great respect about Jim Molan's five years as a senator for, Tas for New South Wales and his distinguished service with the Australian Defence Force, from which he retired as a major general in 2008. Senator Molan's dedication to the people, whether as their parliamentarian or as a member of the Defence Forces, is something to be celebrated. During his four decades in the Australian Army, Jim served in Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, East Timor, Malaysia, Germany, the United States and Iraq, commanding thousands of soldiers across coalition nations in this time. Jim was appointed as Chief of Operations for the Coalition Forces in Iraq. This service was recognised when he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross and Legion of Merit by the Australian and US governments, respectfully, respectively. He was also appointed as a member of the Order of Australia in 1992 and later made an officer in the Order of Australia in 2000. Jim bridged the gap between active service and politics by working with our former Prime Minister Scott Morrison on the Coalition Borders Control Policy, Operation Sovereign Borders. And in his own words, Jim considered this policy to be a successful and humane approach to a complex strategic law enforcement and humanitarian problem. His distinguished career in the Australian Defence Force meant Jim was sought out by the media to speak on defence and national security issues, often discussing the importance of a national security strategy for Australia. He also helped educate readers on warfare, diplomacy and changing relations within our geographic region through his books, Running the War in Iraq and Danger on Our Doorstep. 
As a senator, Jim contributed strongly during debates on immigration, defence and national security policy within the chamber. However, he also spoke passionately about other topics close to his heart, such as veteran support, fuel security, online safety, stillbirth and prostate cancer awareness and research, and foreign affairs and investment. And as a Liberal senator, Jim took every opportunity to champion our great party. He worked hard to build our grassroots membership through sharing our party values and their relevance within our society. The Rayola community in which Jim and his family lived in the New South Wales High Country was richer through his involvement as a volunteer firefighter and rescue helicopter pilot and his advocacy during the recent floods, the Black Summer bushfires in 2009 and the 2003 Canberra bushfires. His passion for the regions he represented through his work as a parliamentarian since 2007 was easy to see. Whether he was speaking with veterans about the wellbeing centres and what they would mean to him, sharing updates about what he and his dedicated team were doing in Parliament House, updating the electorate on how he was representing them in Canberra, or simply giving a glimpse into his family life, his passion for the people he served was evident in everything Jim did. Service was a big part of Jim's life, both military and public, but Jim Molan was also a supportive and encouraging friend, a devoted husband, father and grandfather, and a hard-working, decent man. I offer my sincere condolences to Jim's wife Anne, their four children, Sarah, Erin, Felicity and Michael, and five grandchildren, Sophie, Angus, Eliza, Grace and Andrew. They remembered his full life, courageously lived, devoted to family and in service of the country he loved. Indeed, during his recent funeral, a celebration of life, as previously commented, Jim's daughter, Erin, shared how proud she was of her father and he of them, his four children. Jim was her go-to man, whose opinion she respected most. She says he taught his family to care deeply for each other and their country. Erin said Jim led by example and had instilled in all of them a work ethic that she would be forever grateful for. It's a great legacy. And son Michael spoke of Jim's unwavering appetite, hunger, determination, focus and passion as metaphors for how he lived his life. At this point, I would also like to acknowledge and thank Jim's staff, and in particular Jackie Cummins, who I know has been a great strength to Jim and his family throughout his illness and since his passing. I've also been asked to pass on my brother, former Senator David Bushby's condolences to Jim's family. As the Chief Government Whip at the time Jim first joined the Senate, David worked closely with Jim until David's retirement from the Senate early in 2019. On his Facebook post at the time of his passing, David described Jim's life as a rare example of a life fully devoted to the service of others, combined with a deep desire and conviction to improving their lives. I had the privilege of sitting next to Jim in the Senate chamber for most of the 46th Parliament and appreciated his generous support, encouragement and friendship during that time. I admired and respected Jim and reflected often at how well he managed his cancer diagnosis and the subsequent treatment with grace and bravery as he had lived his life. I will miss Jim and want to thank him for his tireless service throughout his life, lest we forget and may he rest in peace. And Madam Acting Deputy President, I just also wondered if I could seek leave to table a contribution from Senator Brockman, who is unable to be here today. Thank you, Senator Askew. Is leave granted? Leave Thank is you. granted. I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to, uh, to um, give a few short remarks in relation to the condolence motion for former Senator Jim Molan, AODSC. It's without a doubt that his contribution to this place was one of distinguished service, and he did that throughout his life. It's been spoken about in the chamber today by everyone in relation to his service through his military service, uh, his commitment to this nation and to our people, uh, his military service. Um, he rose to the rank of Major General, uh, Defence Material Advocate and Advisor Vice Chief of the Defence Force on Joint Warfighting, Commander of the Australian Defence Colleges, Officer of the Australian Army, Chief of Operations Coalition Forces in Iraq. 
Jim was appointed a member of the Order of Australia in 1992, and he was appointed as an officer of the Order of Australia in 2000. I think what we can take from the contribution from Jim over that time that he served in this place was one of he was open, he was friendly, people have remarked he always had a smile on his face, but the one thing that he gave most of was his time. And I always have believed the greatest gift you can give anyone, whether it's your family, whether it's your friends, whether it's a colleague in need, is time. I think we can all take a leaf out of his book and learn to do that more often. We often talk about people in these condolence motions, about their service, about their personality, and we pay tribute to their families. But it is without doubt that Senator Molan's family not only gave of their time with him when he served in the military forces, but also when he came to this place. And we who sit here and those listening know how much time and sacrifice families make uh, for the service of their loved ones in this place, particularly for him on top of his military service and having family that served in uh, the military, uh, then I know only too well of the sacrifices those families make. I obviously pass on my deep respect and condolences to his wife and to his family, to his friends and extended family. I understand the unimaginable time of grief and loss. What is too, re too difficult um, now not to acknowledge that we have lost three senators in the last two years, with the late former Senator Kimberley Kitchener and former Senator Alex Gallagher and now uh, Senator Jim Molan. It's a time when we should be reflecting on not only our service and our lives and the commitment that our families make to support us here, but we need to ensure that the uh, suggestion that's been made in the past, and I've been uh, speaking to the Special Minister of State, that we need to have recognition of those who die while in office. And I think the best way would be for a rose garden, and I think it's just a mark of respect. Uh, unfortunately, since I've been in this place, we've had four senators who have passed away while in service to their country. So we will continue to do that. I honour Jim's contribution. I never actually got to serve with him on any committees, but we already had Senator Marilyn Deary speak about um, the stillbirth uh, inquiry that she chaired. And I know from conversations I had with others in this place that his personal experience brought a deeper understanding of all of those issues. And I think that just reflected the man that he was. Yes, he was tall in stature, but wherever he was in a room, he did light it up with his charm, his intellect and his friend friendliness. So he will be sorely missed by, I think, everyone in this chamber, irrespective of which side of the chamber from whence you come. But I think it is a time, uh, as I said, to reflect on some of the attributes that have been um, talked about this morning, and I'd like to um, say that I share um, so many of those contributions that have been made and to know that he was respected to have so many people get up and, and make their contribution, I think, is a testament to the man that he was. So my condolences and I say, rest in peace, Jim. You have served your country, you have served your parliament, and you have been a leader of not only of your community but of your family. Rest in peace. Thank you, Senator Polly. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, this is the um, saddest uh, first day back at school uh, that I've ever experienced. Um, uh, it's always a little bit of a downer coming back and, and leaving your family uh, uh, to start the year, but the, the one silver lining is you get to catch up with people you haven't seen uh, for some months. And it's, uh, it was people like Jim, or is people like Jim, uh, that were good-natured, good-humoured, uh, that makes 
uh, this, this town bearable for half a year for us all. So it's extremely sad not to see uh, uh, Jim here this year to catch up with him. Uh, it is very sad on a personal level to have lost him from this place, and it is sad for us as a nation as well uh, to have lost his uh, contribution, especially at these times. Jim, Jim was a great Australian. He, he, he uh, was the uh, living embodiment of the best this country can be. Uh, he was a larrikin, but always in a, in a good-natured, good-humoured way. Uh, he was an authority figure. Uh, he was tall in stature and, and uh, commanded a, a, a level of respect. Uh, but he was never subservient either. He, he didn't uh, himself <laughs> uh, allow authority to, to dictate uh, what he should do. Uh, and most of all, he was just a mate to, to us all, uh, a mate to everybody. And uh, he'd always have a kind word or a generous ear uh, for anyone that came into this place or, or the Senate. Uh, he will be greatly lost. Uh, Jim loved Australia, and uh, Australia loved Jim too. Uh, he has a remarkable record at elections, despite not having won that many. Uh, he actually probably, I think, has received more votes at a personal level than probably anyone else in the parliament uh, today. Uh, when he stood in an unwinnable position in the 2019 election, uh, he ran a little bit of a campaign, pretty hard to do in the Senate to run a personal campaign, uh, but he received over 137,000 personal votes, or below the line votes as we call them. And that's a remarkable achievement. Uh, uh, most of us here uh, are not here uh, on the back of a personal following, all of us really. Uh, we're here uh, to that represent a political party, uh, and people vote. You know, or, uh, overwhelmingly for that party. So we're here on part, part of a team. But Jim was so well known, so loved by Australians, that he was able to, as I say, achieve 137,000 votes. That's more than anyone in the other place gets either. They do get the personal votes, but you know, even the most popular uh, uh, members of the House of Representatives would not achieve half of the vote tally uh, that Jim did at that election. Notwithstanding that, the support he still wasn't able to be elected, um, even on that uh, the remarkable backing. But uh, uh, we're so glad that he did come back for a second stint, uh, especially at the times we've faced. I, I, um, he really was the people's senator then, wasn't he? He was the people's senator because the people actually voted for Jim, unlike the rest of us. Um, I, I, uh, I do uh, take um, some. Uh, uh, credit for, for helping Jim get here in the first place. Uh, uh, he arrived on the back of the citizenship scandal uh, of now over five years ago, and, and uh, as a suspected Italian at the time, uh, I, I, along with a few other pe people in this place, uh, helped to bring about the controversy that allowed uh, uh, Jim entry. Jim did get here on the, on, on the, on the uh, unfortunate. Uh, dismissal and removal of a fellow Nationals senator. So we were a little chagrined in the Nationals party that this upstart from the Liberal Party uh, was coming to take one of our seats. Uh, but uh, uh, after getting to know Jim very quickly, uh, uh, we still felt the loss of um, Fiona, but he was, a, he was a, an ample replacement, especially all the work he did, I know, in regional New South Wales. Um, when Jim first arrived here, I didn't know Jim. I knew of Jim, uh, given particularly his work on Oper Operation Southern Borders, but I didn't personally know him. Uh, but he was one of the few senators to arrive in this place with a real baptism of fire, because uh, for, for whatever reason the press gallery just had it out for him, and they they, they dragged up some retweets and Facebook posts. So I looked it up before I'd forgotten about it. Everyone's forgotten about it. It was such a, uh, a silly controversy. But it was quite intense as these things happen at that time, and for a, a newly arrived senator, it can be very, very uh, intimidating. But I just remember Jim; it was just water off a duck's back to him, and he, a few of us went up and see how he was going. Uh, as I said, I didn't know him, but he, he never looked perturbed by it all uh, under such intense pressure and glare. And I suppose after getting to know him, uh, he was great in this place because he was able to disarm the press gallery. Uh, with as much ease as disarming an unruly militia uh, in a strife-worn town. Like, I mean, they were nothing compared to what he had to deal with in his life. Uh, and uh, a lot of us could take, uh, take, uh, take a leaf out of Jim's book and 
in uh, not being intimidated by uh, the respected ladies and gentlemen upstairs in the press gallery. Uh, and so he very much early established himself as a senior figure within this uh, chamber, and as many other others have commented on, he he uh, contributed widely on a, law, a, a wide list of of areas and policy uh, in policy uh, imperatives for our nation. Uh, I mean, as it has been commented, Jim was a bit of a Renaissance man. He was a soldier, uh, but he was also a firefighter. Uh, he was a writer, a commentator, a father, a great family man, uh, a great Australian. Uh, and while he is well known, or most well known, for his contributions on defence policy, I think it's really important to note the unique perspective he he brought uh, to this most important area uh, of 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 concern for our country. Uh, I had long discussions with Jim uh, about the need to reindustrialise this nation, or to at least avoid our deindustrialisation. Jim had a keen uh, awareness that the ability to defend Australia does not begin and end with the men and women in khaki. It is probably more going to come down to our businessmen and women, uh, our workers in high vis, uh, who can make the things that would allow us, allow those men and women in khaki, to ultimately defend our nation if the worst thing happens. Uh, because I think he had such a wide range of life experiences, he was able to somewhat transcend uh, the often narrow and at times self-interested uh, agendas of the defence establishment uh, in our nation. Uh, he wasn't always just looking at ships and guns and, and submarines and those issues, although he did tanks, of course, although he did make major contributions on those issues. He was also able to look beyond that and see the need for our country to actually have an industry, to have a strong economy uh, that could help uh, defend this great nation of ours. And if there's anything that we can remember Jim for, uh, it would be uh, to take that wider lens uh, on these issues, do not operate in silos and think that just because we've got the latest defence procurement plan ready and done, uh, we will be OK. We do need to take Jim's approach here to these issues and look at our broader risks and, and um, problems for our country. He, of course, was an early uh, uh, um, harbinger of the, of the challenge that we face with the rise of China in our region. I think Jim's views here have been the most impactful because they have been widely accepted, largely, uh, of those risks. But it should be recalled that when Jim started on this, on this uh, raising this issue of China, at the time Australia was signing a free trade agreement with the Chinese government. Uh, uh, we had had almost four decades of uninterrupted improvements in Australian-Chinese relationships, and Jim actually uh, uh, belled the alarm more quickly than most about uh, the fact that this relationship had the potential to go uh, awry very quickly. Now, we've all seen over the weekend a big balloon flying over the continental United States, reminding us all of the wisdom uh, of Jim's approach. Uh, and I hope that we do not ignore uh, uh, Jim, even though he is not in this place any longer, about the need to maintain a very clear-sighted view of the behaviours interests and agendas of the Chinese Communist Party in our region uh, and not be sucked into uh, 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 doing a business or with a country that cannot be trusted. Uh, the way for us to avoid that is to uh, take up Jim's challenge of reinvesting back in our country, in our defences, uh, in our economy. It is the best way we can honour Jim is to continue to live by his example of loving this country and loving it so much uh, that we will do anything uh, to defend it. I am confident that uh, while Jim physically has gone from this place, his ideas and influence and legacy will long uh, uh, shadow over our, our debates. Uh, I often look up uh, through that little glass window up there uh, when I'm sitting in the chamber contemplating my life choices. Uh, uh, hopefully I won't look up and see a balloon anytime soon. Uh, but I will look up now and think of Jim and uh, uh, do everything I can to, to live by his example in, in uh, doing the best by our great country of Australia. Uh, 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 my full condolences go to Jim's wonderful family. It was a beautiful service last week. He's got a 
Uh, that would be his best legacy, a wonderful and loving family. Uh, great that so many of you could be here today. To Anne, to his children and grandchildren, all my condolences and Bale Jim Mullen. Senator Babbitt. Thank you. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge Senator Mullen's family in the gallery. Now, Senator Mullen was a great Australian and his passing, his passing has robbed Australia of a true statesman. His contribution to public life will be missed. Now, Senator Mullen, he loved his country and he dedicated himself to the service of his country every single day. Now, throughout his long and distinguished career, he sought to defend our nation and he never shied away from a fight. Now, he served Australia for four decades in the Army, where he distinguished himself in various conflicts around the world and rose to the rank of Major General, as we all know. Now, his sound judgment led to a senior appointment running the multinational task force in Iraq, yet when he retired from the Army, didn't rest on his laurels. No, he didn't. He threw himself into the defence of Australia once again, this time helping to design Operation Sovereign Borders to protect our country from the uncontrolled flow of unauthorised arrivals that threatened the integrity of our orderly and humanitarian refugee program. Now, despite all the naysayers who said it couldn't be done, the program was a resounding success, so much so that other nations have sought to copy us. Now, even then, Jim was not prepared to sit back and enjoy his well-earned retirement. Instead, he entered the civilian battlefield of politics, winning a seat in the Senate for the Liberals in New South Wales. Now, he used his position to tackle, to tackle the greatest threat facing Australia. And he wasn't afraid to point out that that threat was not climate change. That threat was the global ambition of a rising China. In his last book, Danger on Our Doorstep, which I'm proud to say I do own and I have read, Jim warned that Australia was, was not that, that war with China was not only possible, but it was much more likely than people might realise sitting at home. Yet, as Jim said, Australia is large enough, we are rich enough to defend ourselves. We just have to understand the vital importance of the old saying, if you want peace, you must prepare for war. And as he put it himself, we don't have 75 years to muck around with a Gucci military designed to send small token forces to be part of a US force with the aim of showing the flag. We have to deter China by being capable of winning an armed conflict. We need nuclear-powered submarines, not in a couple of decades, but as soon as possible. Under our current procurement procurement strategy, they will arrive too late to solve our most urgent problem, which is how do we defend ourselves now, particularly if the US was unable to come to our aid. Now, we need to strengthen our military. We need to become more economically resilient, and we need to be psycholog psychologically battle-ready. Now, instead of dividing our nation along racial lines, which some have sought to do, and looking backwards with shame or anger. We need to unite as a people, proud of our achievements, forward-looking and, most importantly, ready to defend our country. Now, Senator Molan was a rare man in this day and age, a man who insisted the fa that, that uh, facts, facts, however unpleasant, must direct our thinking. He insisted that reality, rather than ideology, should inform our perspective and, as a result, his plain thinking and clear-sighted vision provided an invaluable resource to our nation. Now, the best way, I think, to honour Senator Molan's life and work is to take up the baton of properly preparing Australia for a war with China that none of us want to fight, but which we can only deter by being prepared to fight and to win. Our nation has lost a great patriot and a fearless warrior. Now, may he rest in peace and may his legacy live on and inspire us all to do better and to defend our nation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Babette. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to make my contribution to the motion of condolence for Major General Andrew James 
Jim Mullen, AODSC. And I acknowledge his family in the gallery today, and, and I acknowledge the contributions and I associate myself with the contributions of colleagues around the chamber. Uh, and I thank the government uh, for the way that they've supported the arrangements for today's motion, as acknowledged by uh, Senator Birmingham. It is a great tribute uh, to Jim that the government uh, has been prepared to do that. And I think it's a clear demonstration of the mark of respect for Jim across this chamber uh, that the government's been prepared to do that. Much has been said of Jim's service in the military of over 40 years, his service in Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, East Timor, Iraq, and, and 40 years of service in the Defence Force is in itself an extraordinary thing. Um, the progression of his career, his promotions, but then how those experiences became so valuable in the development and the implementation of something like sovereign borders. Jim's understanding of the region, Jim's understanding of the people, not only here in Australia but in Indonesia, and that experience being put to use so powerfully in the design of sovereign borders but then the implementation of it. And the fact that that remains a policy to today is one of Jim's great legacies. Despite the criticisms, criticisms of the policy and its implementation, we understand it, it, its effect. Uh, and it's quite sadly the case that it's on occasions such as this that we learn so much more about our colleagues. And that Jim was so much more than just a military man, as has been indicated today. He was a man who so strongly supported his community. He gave to his community as, uh, in the form of his service through the Country Fire Service, for example. But he was also strong as an advocate for his community as a part of his parliamentary service. Uh, and I had a number of occasions to interact with him when things weren't going as, w as they could be in his community. And his advocacy was always there, as has been said by so many of our colleagues. Um, it wasn't aggressive. It was factual. It was persistent. It was so looking for solutions for his community. Uh, and we all respected him so much for the way that he conducted himself in providing that ad advocacy for his community, for the issues that he was working on. And they've been very well described across the chamber today. And sometimes we actually get cast by the public perception of who we are. Uh, and I think today is a great opportunity for us to be able to reflect on the greater breadth of Jim that was the reality and pay acknowledgement to that and recognise how much he gave in so many different ways. Uh, like Jim, I came back into this place through the accident of Section 44 uh, a little bit after Jim. He'd been here before me and my first interactions with, the, with him were walk, walking to divisions from the part of the building where we'd both been stationed when we came back in. And that was about the time of his hip replacement. And I can always remember walking behind him, catching up with him as we walked down the corridor, how straight he stood. And I think that's... That's a mark of Jim too. He, stru he stood strong, he stood tall. He always did in whatever he did. Uh, and you knew that he was hurting, but he wasn't gonna let it beat him. And he continued to hold a posture. Uh, and that was a reflection of him more broadly, the way that he carried himself. Many people have spoken about his presence, his presence in this place. 
Um, and it was more than, more than just about what he said. He was a man of his word. He was a man that you knew you could trust. He was honest. He is the straightest arrow. The straightest arrow. Um, I'm, I'm so pleased that I had the opportunity to know him. Um, there's been discussion about his smile. Uh, <laughs> when, um, on the very sad occasion of his passing, I was sent some photographs um, of interactions with various colleagues around the chamber. And there's a photograph of me and Jim sitting over there on the corner of the, the chamber when um, the, the place was a lot more sparsely populated. Um, and in divisions, we got to sit right in the far reaches of the chamber. And there was a photograph of him and me smiling and while we were talking to each other. And I think photographs of me smiling over the last three years are a pretty bloody rare thing. Um, <laughs> but Jim managed to get that out of me. And uh, I was so pleased to receive that uh, from my staff. But can I say, there's been a lot of discussion about his love for his family. That smile was never as wide, it was never as proud as when we were talking about his family. Um, we know how much he loved them. It's been said so many times around the, the, the chamber today. But you could see it in him when we were discussing family. Uh, how important his family were to him, how proud he was of his family. Uh, and it wasn't just something that he said. You could see him glow. You could see it in his smile when he was talking about his family. Jim's someone who's been taken from us way too soon. He's given a lot, as we've all discussed. But gee, he had so much more to give. Clearly his legacy will live on through his actions, many of which have been discussed today, through his writings, which will endure, through the policy work that he did. Um, in the Defence Force, in the community, in this parliament, uh, and of course by his own writings. I think we're also pleased in, so pleased in the coalition Senate party room when Jim turned up to see us just before Christmas. I mean, it was so good to see him. He knew things were tough. We all had those personal conversations. But the fact that he took the time to come in and see us uh, was just so special. We're all going to miss him. I think that's evident from what's been said around the chamber. Uh, we know that many others will miss him too, and we send our condolences to them. We know how much his family will miss him. Just based on the fact of how much we're going to miss him. And that they loved him so much more and they will miss him so much more. Sincerest condolences to you, Jim's family, to all those that loved him, to my colleagues who had so much regard for him. Uh, may Jim rest in, in peace. Uh, Valet Jim Motlin. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Let's acknowledge Jim's family, friends and staff uh, in the chamber today as I rise to make some comments on this motion. In Jim's maiden speech, he talked about the words of Napoleon that said, if you want to understand a country's interests, go and look at the graves of its soldiers. And it struck me yesterday as we were at the Australian War Memorial for the last post how appropriate those words were. On the one hand, we were there to remember the life of Lieutenant Stanley Lefebvre. But as we stood and I looked around the gallery and I saw the numbers of uh, campaigns that Australians have been involved with, uh, it brought back memories of Jim and his service and the numbers of places he has served our nation. As we heard words from the Prime Minister talking about service and sacrifice, but also looking beyond the servicemen to the families who were left with a void, it brought me back to Jim and Anne, what you and your family are going through. 
As the Leader of the Opposition spoke about the importance of democracy and freedom and being prepared to stand up and fight and be prepared to defend and promote those things that enable us to be the nation that we are, it brought back to mind all the things that Jim stood for. Again, in his maiden speech, he was kind enough to mention the fact that uh, Senator Reynolds and myself had been the two people he had asked to escort him into the chamber. Not that at that time I knew Jim well. We'd both graduated from Duntroon. We'd had a career in the military. We were both Army pilots. But that was the first time I'd started to have a direct uh, interaction with Jim in a professional capacity. It did, however, give me the advantage of having been in those three institutions to understand their mottos and their ethos and to see it so fully lived out. In a time when so many companies have vision statements and values and people give lip service to things, it's good to reflect on the values that the Army has. Service they define as the selflessness of character to place the security and interests of the nation and its people ahead of their own, of courage, respect, integrity and excellence, all of which we saw in Jim. At Duntroon, the motto was learning promotes strength. And if there's one thing that I knew about Jim from his time here and at his funeral, uh, were the comments about his appetite for learning, for understanding, and how that not only made him strong but made his contributions more powerful to this nation. And the Australian Army Aviation Corps, its motto is vigilance. And we see in Jim's contributions his vigilance, his care for this nation, for his family, and the fact that no effort was too much to help people be prepared. So across the roles people have talked about here today, soldier, senator, parliamentarian, patriot, advocate, aviator, I've seen Jim work. We worked together on the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, and I've seen the detail of his work, his inquisitive nature, his willingness to challenge. Having sat in on Cabinet Office policy committees with Jim, as we worked with leaders at the highest level in the nation to try and explain and advocate for the importance, in Jim's case, of things like a national security strategy. I've seen the diligence, the respect, but also the passion with which he has approached these issues. I've had Jim visit in South Australia in my paired seat of Macon and seen his advocacy, his ability to interact with veterans and then to advocate for them powerfully back in this place. On the international stage, we've heard a lot about Jim and his advocacy here, but one of the groups he was involved with was the high-level uh, military group, which advocated for the rule of law, which sought to understand and to highlight the fact that not all governments, not all societies, actually share the same values about the fact that whilst we, for example, are governed by the rules of armed conflict, there are nations which are authoritarian in nature which will seek to use those things to our detriment. And Jim is the first to admit that he's had his critics along the way, but he was happy to have the critics where he was standing up for something that mattered. And so the report they issued, for example, around Israel and some of Israel's military conflicts where, in his words, Israel demonstrated that they had standards for their defence force in terms of adherence to the rules of armed conflict that matched, if not exceeded, those of our own. Earned him many critics, but it's an example of where he was prepared to put himself forward to advocate for the values that he believed were important. As an aviator, uh, he served in 171 Squadron, as I did. But he was the honorary colonel for the Aviation Corps, and in his words, it was like being the tribal elder. And as I think of Jim's role here in this place, to some extent that's the role he played here. The tribal elder is not necessarily someone who has executive power, 
but the tribal elder is someone who brings a lot of wisdom, of experience, insight and discernment and encouragement. And that's what we saw him bring to the national policy debate to colleagues in this place. There's another aspect to his character that I don't think a lot of people would use to describe Jim. We've heard about his stature, about his leadership, about his ability to command. But I would say Jim had a large dose of humility, which is not something you often associate with senior leaders, whether in politics or in the military. But Jim was humble enough to not only join a local RFS and get on the tools and work, but he was humble enough to learn from people. He was humble enough to relate to people regardless of their stature. As we see his ability to interact not only with the community here, but also professionally with people on all sides of politics, internationally, the relationships he built with the TNI uh, in Indonesia and others, speaks volume of the fact that he saw people, he respected people. And the fact that so many people here have seen Jim as a friend speaks to the fact that he respected people and he had the humility to value them and to value the time that he spent with them. I'd like to finish by returning to the Australian War Memorial. In the midst of the pomp and ceremony of the Federation Guard, of the fine speeches, of the laying of wreaths and all the things that were going on, we were interrupted incessantly by the beating rotors of firefighting helicopters flying overhead. And I thought Jim would think this was fantastic. I can imagine him being far more interested in where they were going, what loads they were carrying, uh, whether they were achieving their mission than he was in the pomp and ceremony. And so I thought that last post ceremony summed up so much of what was great about Jim. Bale Jim Mullen. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Deputy President. And it, I join my colleagues too in rising with great sadness today to pay my respects for the life of Major General and Senator Jim Molan, AODSC, uh, a man I had the great honour of escorting here into the Senate chamber uh, to be sworn in. Uh, a particular honour for me. Uh, as a junior officer within Defence, uh, where there was this towering figure of uh, General Jim Molan. So it was a great privilege and honour that he accorded me. I also acknowledge Anne and all his family, his friends and his staff, who are still mourning the loss of this great man. Uh, Bapak Jim, or General uh, Molan, was the rarest of officers. He was both a soldier's general and a general's general. He had that wonderful magic of the common touch, uh, but also of great command presence. And uh, I thank the family very much um, for allowing many of us to join in that wonderful commemoration of his very rich life. Um, although, as was said, he wasn't much for pomp and circumstance. Uh, I'm sure he was uh, looking down with great delight at this wonderful mixture of military honours and also a service that represented his deep Catholic faith. And in particular, I'm sure he was down there looking with great pride at his very headstrong granddaughters. Um, and he would be sitting there probably chuckling again with pride. Um, and there is no doubt where they get that from. So Australia has lost a true servant of our nation, of our alliance, and also um, a great loss to many people across so many different aspects of Australian life. He was a complex man. He was a gentleman. He was a battle-experienced soldier, a loving and devoted husband, as we've heard, father and grandfather. Uh, and as Senator Fawcett said, he was a man of uh, great humility but also a man of great uh, humanity. Uh, a volunteer firefighter, an insightful author, and a senator focused uh, just as much on strategic geopolitics as he was on fixing some of society's uh, biggest problems and challenges. 
He served, as we've heard, for four decades in the Australian Army before retiring in 2008. Uh, he was justly recognised for his distinguished service with a Distinguished Service Cross and also as part of our alliance, the American Legion of Merit, for the work that he did on Operation Catalyst in Iraq. His distinguished service also included deployments to Papua New Guinea, to Indonesia, Timor-Leste, Malaysia, Germany and, of course, the United States. And I did have the opportunity to travel with Jim uh, to a country we both have great uh, fondness for, and that was to Israel. And I'll never forget our visit to Beersheba, but also going up to the Golan uh, and visiting UNDOF troops there. And I've got this fabulous picture, which I now treasure, of Jim and I standing there with UNDOF soldiers. And there is General Jim with these big um, um, glasses looking out into Syria. And you could see that great, you know, stat you know, the great picture of a true general. But I also greatly admired Jim for his fierce intellect which was so evident in his books, in his command uh, of the Australian Defence College and his, his leadership of thought in command leadership uh, and also, more widely, in politics. Also, as the Minister for Defence, I was very grateful for Jim's approach uh, to how he gave his advice. Um, I always greatly appreciated the way that he did uh, provide advice and insights, but I also greatly appreciated that we had a shared value of seeing the world as it actually is, not necessarily how we would like it to be. I also appreciated that he understood through his personal experience and his academic pursuits that in this place to be politicians as generals to be compassionate for the people that we serve, we often have to be strong and we have to be decisive. And he also understood, as many of us do, that peace for our nation and for the globe does require strength and conviction and courage. He was a true patriot, as many people have said, but he was also a nuanced patriot. Following his career, he became Special Envoy for Operation Sovereign Borders, as we have uh, heard. And again, that was a very challenging role, but we were so grateful on our side of politics, and I'm sure the nation was as well, that we had demonstrated a great policy, an implementable policy, one that re required great strength and courage of convictions to be compassionate, because he, like those on this side, saw that we had to be strong and we had to stop the people smuggling trade because that was the most compassionate outcome for those people who were being exploited and for the thousands and their families who lost thousands of people when they drowned the most horrific deaths at sea. And at Jim's funeral, there were many fitting tributes that captured his warmth, his smile, his leadership, his service, his courage, his community service, his intellect, and, as we've said, his humility and compassion. But I think his priest, Father Grant, captured the essence of Jim so perfectly, and that is a life of gratitude. And that gratitude is reciprocated by his colleagues here and by thousands of others whose lives he touched, that we are so grateful for his life and his contributions. Quite simply, the Senate chamber and Australia will not be the same without him. I extend my deepest condolences to Jim's family, his friends and his staff, uh, who are all here today. And I'm so glad you can be here to hear the respect and the love that we had for Jim. Jim, I will greatly miss your smile, your friendship, your considered advice and what you brought to us all. Thank you for your service a lifetime of service to our nation in so many different roles. And as we said in this service, rest easy, soldier. Your duty is done. Thank you. Senator Scar. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, if I can, at, at the outset, uh, associate myself with the remarks of uh, all of my colleagues 
uh, that I've had the pleasure of sitting and listening to uh, over the course of uh, today. Uh, and Senator Canavan uh, referred to a particular statistic uh, which is quite unique, and that is that uh, our good friend Senator Jim Molan received 137,325 votes under the line when he stood uh, as a senator. And that is an extraordinary figure. And probably that sign of respect and regard from the people of New South Wales, tens and tens of thousands of them, better, uh, better reflects the uh, honour, uh, the respect in which Senator Jim Molan was held in better than anything we can articulate. I too would like to, talk, as my friend Senator James McGrath spoke to, I'd like to also re reflect on Jim's connection with my home state of Queensland. And Jim was, of course, commanding officer of the 6th Battalion of the Royal Australian Regiment and served with great distinction. And that is a battalion that was raised at Alamein, Alamein Barracks in Inogra. And I have spoken to members from the Royal Australian Regiment, veterans of the Royal Australian Regiment, and their respect uh, and regard for Jim. And I'll speak further in that, respect, in that respect subsequently. The motto of that battalion is duty first, duty first. And everything which Senator Jim Molan did in his capacity as a senator in this place in his capacity as a soldier, in his capacity as a pilot, a linguist, a commentator, reflected that duty first. But we do recognise, of course, that Jim was a husband, a father, a grandfather and a brother, and that perhaps was the greatest duty which he bore. And I reflect firstly in relation to how Jim was a mate to us. He was a work colleague, so he was something more than a senator or a general. He was, he was a mate. And I remember uh, when I first met Jim uh, at an early morning meeting, and senators on the coalition side would have our early morning meetings when we'd discuss notices of motion at a quarter past eight or eight o'clock in the morning, and quite often these notices of motion were brought on uh, on a day's notice. They dealt with many uh, disparate topics. Sometimes they're pushing uh, ideological agendas, other times seeking wedge politics. And a group of us would always get together first thing in the morning and discuss these notices of motion. And it was really in that context each morning, first thing in the morning, you might have had a, a, a bit of a torrid day in politics the day before, that. As soon as Jim arrived or when Jim was there and you saw that big smile, it just meant so much to us. It just meant so much to us and it was such a privilege to work with him. Jim was also my um, buddy when we used to walk back to our offices from divisions and senators here will know what that means. Uh, so on the floor above, uh, Jim's office was down the left side of the corridor, mine was at the right, and typically we'd walk up the stairs together down the hallway and we would linger for maybe five or ten minutes at the fork in the hall as we discussed various things. And I think I, looking back on those moments, I really cherish those moments. I really do. And the times on which he spoke uh, about his love for his family, um, his admiration for his daughter Erin, and how you were defending. Uh, your honour uh, and reputation through the court system and how much how important that was to him uh, and also uh, his intellectual curiosity i 'd talk to him about what I was reading or books i 'd read, uh, and he was always interested, always enthusiastic. he always had that sense of enthusiasm which meant so much to us. Um, Jim used to laugh at my jokes Jim used to laugh at my jokes uh, and sorry. A great man indeed, says Senator Henderson. But that's what Jim was. He had such a generosity of spirit uh, and a great sense of humour. And as Senator Colbeck st said, uh, we spent a lot of good times in these corners during the awful COVID pandemic, 
Uh, in that corner, we used to call the sensible corner, and uh, quite often um, those on this side of the place during divisions, uh, we would gather when we had to all spread out for the COVID pandemic in that corner, uh, and, and Jim would be there, my friend Cinder Colbeck, Cinder McLaughlin and others, uh, and, and have good chats um, and lift the, um, lift the darkness somewhat of what was a terrible time. But there's also, there's also the great contribution Jim made to public debate, and in no better way was that articulated than in Jim's passion for a national security strategy. So I would like to read onto the record an excerpt from an article which Jim wrote for the uh, Australian Strategic Policy Institute on 30 July 2021, and I do want to read these paragraphs into the record in acknowledgement and respect for Jim's deeply held views in this regard. And I quote, and you can almost I, I can hear Jim saying these words as I read this. But how can there be a defence strategy without an overarching and comprehensive national security strategy? What good is it to have a brilliant defence strategy without national liquid fuel, industry, pharma, science and technology, manpower, diplomacy and stocking policies, and a plan to move from peacetime processes to the wartime processes that are implied? What good is it for us to be world class at anti-access aerial denial based on brilliant material solutions if we can no longer feed the people due to a lack of diesel and if we're unable to move smoothly from a peacetime footing to a wartime footing in government and the bureaucracy because we haven't thought it through and because we lack modern plans or processes? And if the government will put $270 billion into defence over the next 10 years because of the strategic environment, what are we doing for the nation as a whole? If we think vaccinating the population is difficult, try mobilising." And there's something which is just so typical of Jim's common sense founded on decades of experience in this space. And those are thoughts um, and, and, and a vision in terms of the national security for this country which all of us should reflect on and seek to take forward um, in memory of Jim. The third uh, area I want to touch on is last Thursday I spent an evening at the Gaythorne RSL with a good friend Nev Robinson uh, who served in the Royal Australian Regiment. And, uh, Nev had served in Malaya, in Borneo, in Vietnam and Jim meant a lot to Nev as I'm sure Jim meant to hundreds of thousands of Australians. And Nev is a very patriotic Australian. He's had his health challenges of late, but he still wanted to spend that time sitting down with me at the Gaythorne RSL and giving his thoughts on Jim. So I want to convey those thoughts to this chamber now with respect to Jim. And we sat down and we spoke about Jim's book, Running the War in Iraq. And there are three um, items which Nev, amongst others, highlighted for me, and I wish to just speak quickly in relation to those three items. The first was, uh, and, and Nev actually went through and he highlighted, um, he highlighted pages out of Jim's book. He actually went to Office Works. Um, he was late to the catch up at the Gaythorne RSL, and he rang me up and he said, "Mate, I'm on my way. I had to go to Office Works. I wanted to photocopy these pages." And show you this is you've got to you've got to reflect on this. So Nev, I'm I'm doing that now, mate. Um, the first area is in relation to Jim's time in East Timor, at that extraordinarily difficult time when the people of East Timor voted for independence and democracy, and Jim was on the ground in the most dangerous of positions, providing assistance both to Australians but also to civilians and leaders in the East Timorese community. And I just wanted to read a few paragraphs from this excerpts of this book because I think that provides uh, an element of uh, insight into the sorts of issues Jim was managing on the ground for the benefit of people. And I quote, and he's talking about his time at a place called Barkau. And I quote, as the only uniformed Indonesian speaking person who knew some of the militia, I tried to sort out the mess on the tarmac. The UN quite bravely refused to leave unless the safety of the locals could be guaranteed. Groups of terrified locals sat in a big block of humanity on the tarmac, with the UN workers surrounding them. Meanwhile, the militia were getting more and more worked up. Quite further, 
For most of the day, we negotiated over each group of local refugees. As I spoke with the sergeant, he nervously drew and reholstered his pistol. And this sergeant was from the militia. This worried me, both because it may have been a signal of his intent and because it definitely was a safety issue. The tension kept building. And then, and then it turned out that amongst this group was Bishop Bellow, who was a leader of the Catholic Church in East Timor and had been a trenchant critic of the Indonesian government. So Jim was then faced with this group of civilians, but also with this cardinal, in their, bishop, in their midst. Now that we had moved some Timorese off the airport, the logjam was broken, and the sergeant agreed that the rest could go in the C-130s. I felt I was finally making some progress, but as the militia commander and I were walking back towards the remaining group of Timorese, we noticed that among them was the religious leader of East Timor, the vehemently anti-Indonesian bishop Carlos Bello, dressed in civilian clothes. Bello had been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1996 with Jose Ramos Horta, then the voice of the people overseas, for advocating non-violent resistance to Indonesian rule. Now here he was, sitting on the tarmac, surrounded by other refugees. Early on, Bello had been threatened by the Dili militia in a pamphlet that read, For now your robe is white, but it will soon be covered in the colour of your own blood. End quote. And this is a situation which Jim was facing on that tarmac. Conscious of how much danger Bello was in, I told the militia sergeant that the bishop should be allowed to go to Australia. Allowing such a prominent global figure to be killed would be unforgivable. I remember stumbling in my fatigue for, for an appropriate local translation for Nobel Prize winner. And then Jim, de Jim describes how he dealt on a very human, empathetic basis with that local militia, militia sergeant to effecti effectively negotiate an outcome where Bishop Bellow safely led, left that tarmac with all of those other civilians who are at risk. Just an absolutely outstanding outcome. And then he describes how uh, at the last moment, at the last moment when he just about successfully negotiated Bishop Bellow's uh, release and, he, and they were getting on the planes, this militia sergeant got the wobbles and all of a sudden wanted to drive a truck out to uh, block the plane leaving. And again, Jim had to intercede and convince this militia sergeant that, no, that was not the right thing to do. It was too late. Let them go. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. The second, the second extract from Jim's book uh, that we talked about on last Thursday night was the eight million Iraqis, eight million Iraqis who voted on 30 January 2005 when they were first given the opportunity, eight million of them, and how much that meant to Jim, as he outlines in his book, and the fact that he was actually gifted by the Independent Electoral Commission of Iraq the ninth ballot paper that was cast in that election, and he treasured that. As, as representing what that mission was all about in terms of providing freedom and democracy to the people of Iraq. And lastly, Anne, I note uh, Jim's comments when he was presented with the US Legion of Merit. And I'll quote. And these are Jim's words. The day after I returned from Germany in August 2005, Air Chief Marshal Angus Houston, on behalf of the US Secretary of Defence, presented me with the official medal for the US Legion of Merit. Anne was invited to the function. She's been with me forever in a way that I never deserved, and I have often rewarded her with absence and worry." End quote. So, uh, finally, if I can say to you, Anne, if I can say to the family, um, it was such a deep honour. It was such a deep honour to attend the beautiful service for Jim at Duntroon. Uh, to the children, you did your dad so proud. There is probably no harder speech to give than the speech which you had to give on that day, but you did him so proud. You should really feel honoured of, um, of the contribution you made that day. And lastly, Anne, I've got, uh, I've got a card from Nev, who also served at uh, RAR, uh, and I promised to him 
after our meeting at the Gaythorn RSL that I'll deliver this to you personally. Um, so I will come and uh, do that now. And as, uh, as the father at the service said, uh, we should reflect on, um, on being grateful. And I am so grateful, so grateful that I had the honour and privilege um, to work um, and be a colleague, be a mate uh, of your husband, your father, your grandfather and brother. Vale, Senator Jim Mullen. Senator Henderson. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I rise with a very heavy heart and enormous sadness to join with my Senate colleagues in honouring the magnificent life of Andrew James Molan, AODSE. A life of service to his country, to his community, to the parliament, a life of unconditional love for and pride in his family, and a life of courage on the battlefield and in the battle of ideas. A life lived like few other Australians, because Jim Molan was a giant amongst men. I convey my deepest condolences to Jim's beloved wife Anne, his four children, Sarah, Erin, Felicity and Michael, his adored grandchildren and broader family. Jim's passing has left a gaping chasm in the Senate and in our lives. I was honoured to call him my friend. Whatever the cause or the mission, he went about his work with unwavering dedication, intellect and courage. He was so kind and principled and funny and always positive. He walked with a bounce. For someone who rose to such high ranks in the Australian Defence Force, Jim was also incredibly humble and gracious. In Senate estimates, including on the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee, which I chaired for some time, the former Major General who rose to run the multinational forces in Iraq and then co-authored and helped execute Operation Sovereign Borders as Special Envoy would question Home Affairs officials about national security matters with enormous purpose and insight but always with deep respect. Never once did he give the impression that he knew more than they did, even though I am certain that was so often the case. Jim and I formed a special bond when he re-entered the Senate shortly after me in 2019, with Jim filling the casual vacancy left by Arthur Sinodinus, who went on to become Australia's ambassador to the United States. During that gruelling pre-selection process, we would touch base frequently and give each other moral support. His win and re-entry back into the Senate was broadly celebrated, but to members of the Liberal Party around the country, Jim was a rock star. His understanding of the national security th threats we faced, his willingness to call it out and advocate for better policies, including a national security strategy, was held in the highest of regard. Uh, as Senator Scar has just referenced, Jim would be cheering from the rooftops, hearing Senator Scar read out part of his rationale for a national security strategy. In early 2020, I asked Jim to be my special guest at a special Australia Day celebration that I was planning, but as COVID began to emerge, uh, we needed to cancel. Uh, we planned to reschedule the event, but it was never to be. I won't recite Jim's extensive CV, which has been very well documented in this motion, other than to say few men have served our country with such high distinction. Jim's awards included an Officer of the Legion of Merit awarded by the United States in 2004 and the Distinguished Service Cross awarded in 2006. He was also appointed a member of the Order of Australia in 1992 and an Officer of the Order of Australia in 2000. Jim was highly respected as a public commentator on defence and national security issues and as an author. It was indeed an honour to attend his book launch last year in Parliament House of Danger on Our Doorstep. This is a must read. Jim and I would often speak about the horrors of social media trolling 
and his pride in you, Aaron, for standing up to what you endured. He was so proud for you, the way you stood up to the bullies and the trolls and to those who defamed you and belittled you and abused you. He was so proud of your work, including your amazing support and advocacy for the Coalition's Online Safety Act. He was in the trenches with you every step of the way. Thank you, Jim, for your legacy, which inspires us as senators to be more courageous to never give up fighting for what is right in the service of our country. To live our best life, to express our gratitude, to love our family and friends, and to leave nothing on the field. We all love Jim. And they were my last words to him in a message at the end of last year after he came to visit us in the Senate party room. I wrote, don't worry about your emotions, no one could care less. We all just love you and miss you and want you back as soon as possible. Jim, rest in peace. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much. Well, today we honour and celebrate the life of a of a good friend, colleague, statesman, father, family member, and of course a great Australian. And uh, I pass on my deepest condolences to Jim's wife and his children, Sarah, Aaron, Felicity, Michael, and all extended family and those that were closest to Jim. As you've heard today, Jim has left a lasting legacy of service to Australia. Through his distinguished military career and indeed as a senator here in this place. Jim served, as we've heard, in the Defence Force for over 40 years. A tremendous service to the Australian people and indeed right across the world. From graduating at the Royal Military College Duntroon to commanding more troops than any Australian since World War Two during his time in Iraq, as well as being deployed in Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, Timor-Leste, Malaysia and Germany. Though clearly after such a distinguished uh, career in the military, he wanted to continue to serve his nation and he's done that here in this place. Unfortunately, Jim and I never got to serve on any committees together that many of my colleagues have remarked on and those from both sides have spoken about their experience and how they profited personally from working with him. Now, I never got that opportunity, but it didn't matter because, like uh, Senator Scar was saying, there were other moments throughout our week where we did get to interact, and, and, and it was, whether it was in those uh, early morning meetings where we were discussing policy motions or during a division or, or during one of our party room meetings or just simply a morning tea. You get the opportunity to talk with Jim, and I think one of the things that really stood out to me was he was never short of an encouraging word. Uh, he'd often be maybe in his office, and he'd have the TV on, and so he'd be uh, have the chamber uh, broadcast as he's probably you know, doing some work, uh, possibly writing a book like this or doing something, and uh, and he'd obviously he'd keep one ear to, to the to the screen and listening to to what was happening, and and he'd. So he'd take note of a speech you've given and he, he would always take the time to say, I loved what you said when you spoke about this. And he always took that time to acknowledge the work of others. And this is coming from a man that was, had achieved so much. So when you got an encouraging word from someone like Jim, you really took it to heart. And he'd always take that time. The other thing that really stood out to me and I think uh, many have remarked on this today as well, is that uh, Jim was unapolog unapologetically patriotic. His courage led him from the front lines of war to this very Senate chamber, where in both cases he fought tirelessly to protect and safeguard 
the future of Australia. And to echo the words of uh, former Prime Minister Tony Abbott, Jim never did anything for Jim. He always did it for our country and for the causes he believed in. Through his role as a senator for New South Wales, Jim has been sounding the alarm of the sleeping aggressor to our North China and Australia's military preparedness to combat this inevitable conflict. And even though his battle with cancer, through his battle with cancer, he continued to raise awareness on the CCP writing The Danger on Our Doorstep, a book that I would recommend to everyone. Now, without letting Jim know, I purchased uh, a number of these books uh, to be able to give away as, as gifts. And uh, Jim's staff must have uh, let him know that I'd made this purchase, and so he, he added an extra one in uh, that was especially for me. Now, I'd actually, he didn't know that I actually already had a copy, but I've kept this special one because he's, he's written in the front of it. And he's written in his own pen, For the Sovereignty and Freedom of Australia. Thanks, Matt. And this is, I think, those words, few words, sum up who Jim was and the commitment that he had and fighting right through to the very end for the sovereignty and the freedom of Australia. And then right through his, his battle with cancer, Jim was an example to all of us. And some have remarked today, uh, Liberal colleagues and national colleagues, that Jim came into our very last party room meeting at, uh, at the end of conclusion of last year. And we didn't know he was coming. He, he, he turned up towards the end and he, when he stood with his big smile and he, he, he encouraged us all and he wished us all well. And you know, we knew that he was battling at that time, yet he took that time to come in and speak with us and share with us again another encouraging word. But I quote from this book that Jim's written, and it's on page 131. It is a moral failure of the highest order to expect the spirit and blood of the nation will act as a substitute for proper preparations to face evil in the world. Australia must band together, and we need to heed Senator Molan's warning. With the Indo-Pacific region in a constant state of instability, come rail, hail or shine, Australia must be prepared, be ready and able. And as President Reagan once remarked, heroes come when they're needed. Great men step forward when courage seems in short supply. And Jim was not short supply of courage. Fale Jim Mullen. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I too rise to offer my condolences to uh, um, Senator Jim Mullen's family and on the passing of uh, a very great Australian, um, a friend, a colleague, uh, someone who we could always approach uh, with confidence, knowing that uh, our interactions with him would always uh, help inspire us to, to make, uh, I think, the right decisions in this place, um, given his uh, depth of experience. Uh, both in the military but also in life in general. We um, have heard today um, on many occasions about Jim and um, his extraordinary life, his uh, life of service, his dedication to this great country, um, his dedication through the military career and his public life as a senator on and off on a, on a couple of occasions. But uh, above all, he was a loving husband a, a father and a grandfather, and uh, I was at the funeral a few weeks ago. And you know, sadly, it's funerals where you get to know someone a bit more. Um, and I sort of wish, uh, and I'll probably take this, you know, for everyone in this place to really get to know all our colleagues, because um, Jim certainly was someone who loved his family. He certainly put his family first, and certainly tried to shield them from his own battles. But the one thing you did take away from that service was. Uh, he generally did put his family first and certainly a lot of uh, lessons that we could all learn uh, from Jim's life. Um, apart from obviously serving his nation with great distinction and, and as we've heard in, in, in Papua New Guinea um, and also been made an officer of the Order of Australia for his service in Indonesia and East Timor, um, he also was the chief of the operations of the coalition forces in Iraq. 
quite a defining moment for I think our military and for a number of people that I talked to, uh, particularly in the army, uh, who have served alongside Jim. Um, you know, the soldiers general, as he's been referred to, uh, really does take away the, the the impact that this great man has had on so many lives. People who look up to Jim uh, as a role model. Uh, I know a number of his staff, uh, former staff particularly, who we've interacted with, my office has interacted with, who could only say great things about Jim and, and his leadership. And uh, quite frankly, it is such a loss to not have Jim in this place, but certainly his, his memories and uh, in some ways his ghost will always be here. And I'll always remember the conversations that I had with Jim, uh, particularly one afternoon when I delivered a speech on, on the subject of China and their abuses, human right abuses. And Jim afterwards came up to me and had a chat and I thought, geez, this is going to go two ways. Either he's going to have a go at me for not going hard enough or uh, he's going to say, well done, mate. And uh, he certainly did uh, compliment uh, me on, on my remarks about the, the shocking abuses that uh, the regime, the authoritarian regime conducts on its people and a number of other minorities. Despite, I guess, retiring from defence, um, the Defence Force back in July 2008, um, Jim remained deeply engaged in the national, in, in the national defence conversation. And you know, as uh, Senator O'Sullivan rightly pointed out, there's several books that he wrote, um, several books, opinion pieces, uh, many interviews on Sky News um, and and other broadcasters. But he was always very passionate about the, the security of our country. Why? Because of his family and the safety of his family and his grandchildren. Wanted to make sure that future generations of Australians can live and really enjoy the freedoms that people like Jim and others in our military have actually defended our values uh, and many wars for, for many, many decades. Always at the forefront was family, as it sh so should be. So defence remained a really key focus for Jim after his election to this place in 2017, and we were fortunate to have uh, someone who was so dedicated to national security that was present here in this, in this chamber. Uh, and of course, uh, while uh, there was big focus on national security, we've also heard um, he made such a large and lasting contribution on so many other issues in this place, particularly around stillbirth research, uh, I know a number of my colleagues and, and those opposite have uh, touched on this at great length, uh, but also in education as well too, because he was a big believer in making sure that the next generation of Australians should be entitled and have the right to be educated, have the right to have access to good education, because the more educated we are, the better outcomes that this country will have and will be a, a smarter, clever and much more productive country in the long haul. So I do want to pay tribute to his family who are here today. Um, you know, Jim was a man of conviction. He, he was a great Australian, a very fierce advocate for the people of uh, the state of New South Wales. Um, despite uh, him and I sort of having argy barges that I'd always go for Queensland, the state of origin, and clearly he'd go for the the blue side. But you know, a great man, and I was really saddened to learn about his death um, when I was over in Washington. Uh, last month with uh, a number of my colleagues here in the Senate and in the other place uh, on a delegation uh, in the United States on, funnily enough, for, on matters relating to foreign affairs and defence matters. Uh, we were all sort of taken aback with the fact that Jim had passed. Um, I, I just also just want to touch on um, just his recent book that was titled Danger on Our Doorstep. Now, I know there's been a bit of contribution on this, but from my point of view, he certainly put forward very good views about the prospects of the conflict in our region, and a real wake-up call, uh, and an honest wake-up call that this country really needs to take seriously. It's all well and good to rely on allies, and as we have done for many, many decades. But we, as a nation, need to stand on our two feet. You know, we are a country that is getting close at 30 million population, and we should be able to protect ourselves, or at least have deterrence in place. Uh, not against just other countries like China or others, but really making sure that we are in a strong position so that the worst possible outcome doesn't really happen. And if it does happen, at least we can defend ourselves, because we know that 
we can put up a fight. But his book did really go to the heart about um, the, the issues at play at the moment that we are all seeing in the media. But he did so while undergoing you know, cancer treatment and really is remarkable for someone who went through that. Um, um, you know, the, the security of our nation was never far from his mind despite all the health issues he was going through. And in that most recent round of estimates, remember he chairing uh, the Defence, Foreign Affairs and Trade Committee, uh, you know, seeing Jim walk in, uh, giving Jim the first call, you know, that big smile that we all sort of remember, um, you know, and for him to have the ability to put forward that line of questioning to the department, to officials, to uh, Minister Wong uh, and the others that were present at the table, really, for me, uh, will always remain, I guess, interesting to my mind about who that man was, you know, a, a great Australian who was always committed to the cause right till the end. Um, and certainly that big smile will never really leave me. Uh, and I really wish um, we had more people like him in this place. But sadly, um, Acting Deputy President, uh, I, I uh, you know, want to pass on my condolences to Jim's family, to his wife, his children and grandchildren. Uh, a man of great gratitude, as we heard at his uh, funeral service. Valet Jim, we'll miss you, mate. Senator Bragg. Uh, thank you very much. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I'd like to offer my condolences to the Mullen family and I'd like to associate myself with the remarks today, uh, particularly those of the Leader of the Government and the Leader of the Opposition here in the Senate. Uh, I won't seek to run through the very significant professional and personal achievements of Senator Mullen or Jim, as he was better known to us here. Uh, I will say that I always thought we were very fortunate to have someone who had done so much put themselves forward as a candidate for public office. And there is no doubt uh, that Jim was a great asset, not only to the country and the state, but also to the Liberal Party. He was one of the best known people in the Liberal Party. Uh, and he was uh, widely loved by people who knew him. And the most important thing that I uh, reflected on uh, when I went to his service a couple of weeks ago at Duntroon was that this was a person that had had a huge impact on the country. Uh, he had given extraordinary service, but he had, he had, had an impact. Uh, and uh, that was very profound. Now, on the personal side, I got to know Jim pretty well. We sat together here and we had many years of interaction through the Liberal Party in New South Wales. Now, on one of the strange assignments I had in 2017, I was asked to bring together an online newsletter for the Liberal Party and I approached Jim uh, about whether he would write some articles about uh, the, uh, the world we live in and uh, uh, the role of the armed forces and the like. And uh, His first question was, is this for young people? And it was for young people. And he was very committed to educating younger people. He was interested in young people. He was always interested in the future. Now, he had no time for tiddlywinks. He was not interested in the, uh, the charades we go through here in the Senate sometimes. Uh, he was always focused on the big issues. And I think he was at times frustrated that so much of the time here was spent on tiddling things and was wasted. And uh, he was, he was a, a man on a mission who wanted to spend his time wisely, uh, and he did. And he was never one for the talking points. And he has been able to achieve a very rare political feat, which is to be wildly popular with the rank and file of the Liberal Party but his own man every single day. Uh, and he, he was never one for the talking points. And uh, he had a huge impact on Australia. He was a great asset to the country and to our state and to our party. And uh, he was a very warm and kind person. I found him to be uh, incredibly kind. He was the sort of person that if something bad had happened to someone, he would ring that person and say, 
I'm here for you, or I know that's happened, and I'm available to speak to you. And I know that because he called me on many difficult occasions, and he was a, uh, he was a very good man. So um, I wanted to pass on my deepest condolences to his family. Senator Rennick. Ah, thank you, Acting Madam Deputy Chair. It is great, with this great sadness that I rise to speak on the passing of Senator Jim Molan. While I only knew Jim for a short time, it was apparent that he was a man of integrity who cared deeply for his country and its future. He was incredibly driven to ensure that as a nation, Australia was self-resilient, not just in defence, but in all aspects of society. He was not driven by the flawed ideologies of the chattering classes. Instead, he wanted Australia to control its own security infrastructure, manufacturing and supply lines. His thinking was much closer to the protectionist views of Deakin and Menzies that understood the importance of nation building and self-reliance. Jim had a distinguished career in the Army, where he served his country with distinction. I was fortunate enough to meet him first at an LNP event where he was the guest speaker. He flew up to Queensland to support a candidate who served under him in the Iraq War and later as his aide de camp. It speaks to the character of Jim that, regardless of his rank, he never had any tickets on himself. I wasn't surprised to hear his family and friends comment at his funeral that Jim didn't like ceremonies. That seemed to correspond with my brief knowledge of him that he was more driven by outcomes than accolade or pretentious posturing. I was much more surprised to hear his family talk about his disdain for rules that didn't make sense given Jim had risen so far in the military. It speaks to his affable and constructive nature of Jim that he was able to become a major general in the army while also being able to question rules that didn't seem right. In this day and age, it's rare to see people who question a narrative climb so high in any organisation. It's an indication of how Jim could persuade people to his way of thinking without burning bridges. In my conversations with him, Jim was disappointed that Western leaders allowed the wars in the Middle East to go for so long when there was clearly no strategic objective. He made it quite clear that it only lowered troop morale and diverted funding and attention from the more serious threats in the Pacific. It was a view that I agree with entirely. Jim played an instrumental part in stopping the boats during the first year of the Abbott government. It is estimated that over 1,000 people lost their lives at sea trying to enter Australia. While many were sceptical that it could be done, it speaks to the ability of Jim, who played an instrumental role part in making it happen. Originally scorned by many opposite in other, and in other Western countries, the policy is now the benchmark by which to prevent illegal arrivals. Far from being a callous policy, as many, many critics like to assert, it has prevented many people from drowning at sea. Jim served with distinction in many other areas, in many areas including Papua New Guinea, East Timor, Indonesia and firefighting, which many others who know him have, spoke, have touched on today. The greatest tribute I can give to Jim is to continue his goal to ensure that Australia is prepared for future challenges. Australia needs to be more self-resilient in its defence capabilities that focus on our region. It's time the Defence Department, Department listened to his concerns that Australia has no integrated national security strategy focused on defending Australia and delivered one. As a politician, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we should all mirror his ability for sound diplomacy, his integrity and can-do attitude. My condolences to his family and many friends. Rest in peace, Jim. Senator Pham. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. To Anne, Felicity, Erin, Sarah and Michael, I send my heartfelt condolences and deepest wishes. While Jim was a dedicated servant of Australia, there's absolutely no one who would not agree that Australia is better off for Jim's contributions to public life. Jim, yes, served the nation in the Australian Army, rose to the rank of Major General, serving as Chief of, Chief of Operations for the Coalition Forces in Iraq, which was no small feat, which he certainly left his mark. Before that, he spent his time in Papua New Guinea, working with the police and security forces, time in Jakarta when Suharto fell and working in East Timor in negotiations with the local armed militia before the Australian Army arrived. 
efforts had no doubt saved many, many lives. The stories that have been told of his exploits while on these diff difficult postings leave little to the imagination that he was anything but a true Australian hero who asked for no thanks. Simply, what more could he do for the people of Australia? Jim was always full of surprises. In the roughly three years I knew him, he was always surprised me. I remember not long after he rejoined the Senate, we were sitting in the other place for a joint uh, sitting where the President of Indonesia, Joko Widodo, addressed us. And I'm sitting there, and we're all sitting there with our translation earpieces on, and I see Jim take his off. And he's just listening along and nodding and like he knew what was going on. I gave him a shove in the, in the ribs with my elbow and said, do you speak Bahasa? And he went, yeah, 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 of course I do. You know, I spent three years there, or five years, forgive me, what, whatever it was. He was always full of those sort of surprises. Such was the depth of his talent. As a realist, Jim was well aware of both our strengths and our vulnerabilities in the world and worked until the end to ensure that those vulnerabilities were fixed. This meant that after giving everything to serve the nation in the army, he decided it wasn't enough and chose to serve in public life in many other ways, but finally as a senator for New South Wales, rather than the retirement he so richly deserved. Many senators are elected to this chamber. However, many, if not most, will make as great an impact on public debate as Senator Jim Boland did. Jim was many things, but one thing that I admired most about him was his commitment to his values and his application of these values towards improving Australian life. Jim once said, and I quote, our values are what make us strong, bring us together and set us apart from other nations, and that the values we hold as a nation must be reflected in the actions of our military both at home and abroad. Sharing a passion um, with Jim on the, in the defence space meant we got to spend a lot of time together talking, debating, exchanging ideas and ultimately disagreeing on a number of points, but very few. But the great thing about Jim was that you could do this. You could disagree in a respectful manner and continue on being friends, which is a trait that the world needs more of, not less. And Jim, you were, if nothing else, a great friend. One of the things we agreed on is that Australia is woefully underprepared for a war, a war likely not of our making, but one we will likely have to fight. Whether by standing, where standing by won't be an option. A war in the region doesn't have to include an invasion of our land to be catastrophic to our way of life. That all or at least most of our seaborne trade will be affected will bring about a catastrophic effect on Australia's economy and our way of life that only an evasion would surpass. And as I said, we both thought that this was unlikely. So our part in any war is most likely to be aiding allies to keep our sea lanes of communication open. How we do that? That's the challenge that, that Jim set us all. His commitment to this would be almost unrivaled. While battling cancer, he still managed to be engaged in all of his parliamentary duties, or most thereof, and even writing and releasing a book last year, which, if you haven't read it, you're really letting yourself down. It is such a well-written book on a topic he knows so well and I recommend it to everyone. To those who knew him, know that as soon as Parliament was done and he was finished battling other members and senators of Parliament on both sides, he loved to hit the road and be out in the community and talking to constituents. But through all of this, he managed to raise and be there for a family that loved him deeply and whom he loved deeply in return. In Jim's first speech, he spoke of four lessons that he learned from his 40 years in the military that he thought were important enough to bring into politics and wider social life. 
and I think that they are important to repeat on this occasion. Firstly, leadership is everything. Second, Australia brings its unique culture into its military. Blind obedience to orders or authority does not make good soldiers, nor does it make good citizens. Third, as a leader, once you find someone who knows what they're doing, get out of the way. And fourth, stereotypes are invariably wrong. As a man that achieved more than most of us mortals could ever hope to achieve, his words ring tr just as true as when he first spoke them. Jim truly was a giant of Australian life, and we are surely worse off without him. He will be greatly missed in these halls, and I know I will personally feel his loss. The last meeting I had with Jim was after a Coalition Defence Policy Committee, a committee that I chair, that he always attended, as, or certainly as much as he could. And his last words to me were, Vanny, keep up the fight. Fale, Jim. Senator Little. Thank you. My interaction with Senator Jim Molan reminds me it's not how long you have, but what you do with the time you have. I came into the Senate on 1 July 2022, so I had just a few interactions with Senator Molan, but he did leave a big impression. I immediately understood that he was a deep listener and a respectful responder. His service with distinction meant I already knew he had courage. I learnt from that, in that brief time that I had with him, that his special gift was also helping others to recognise their own courage and the immense potential in themselves. Thank you to his family for sharing him with us, for sharing him with those in the Defence Force that relied on his leadership, and for sharing Senator Molan with this parliament and with Australia. Oh, Senator McLaughlin. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, it's with sadness that I rise to speak on the condolence motion for my colleague, Senator Andrew James Molan. I wish to express to the Senate my appreciation to Jim for his service to this place and to the nation. I especially thank him for his kind and gracious welcome to, he extended to me when I arrived to the Senate from South Australia. I thank him for his friendship and his wisdom. I will miss him and I bid him farewell. My thoughts and prayers are with his family and friends. Rest in peace, Jim. Thank you, Senator McLaughlin. I ask senators to join in a moment of silence to acknowledge the passing of Senator Molan, remember the contribution which he made to the Senate and to signify assent to the motion. Thank you, Senator. Senators, the motion is carried. Senator Gallagher. Madam President, I move that as a mark of respect to the memory of the late Senator Jim Molan, the Senate do now adjourn. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The Senate stands adjourned till tomorrow at midday.